Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're continuing on our mission to understand the full meaning of what light actually is. And so we left off last time with the advent of the, of the wave theory of light being dominant in all in modern physics and 19th century physics. Well, the next step in this whole thing is to actually really determine how the wave propagates. So, and also linking things. We're gonna find that there's some amazing things that occur as we, go, as we look. So in 1831, a great experimentalist by the name of Michael Faraday, who was also at the London Royal Society, he discovered through lots and lots of experiments, he was just a real tinkerer. And so as he tinkered with things, he found that if he took a magnet and he moved it across a wire, it creates a current. And so this is called an induction. So it's in uh, electric field, in, an electric field was induced by the magnet. So Michael Faraday uh, said, wow, if I take a current, if I take a loop of wire and put a voltmeter on it, which can measure the uh, voltage that's going, and you pass a magnet across and the voltmeter uh, swings. That means that there's a, some sort of electromotive force, that's what he devised, they called it, so the electromotive force actually caused a current. So we could actually create a current by simply moving a magnet near a wire. And a wire is a conductor, meaning it allows electricity to go through it. So this is an experimentally derived thing. And the behavior now is going to need, to, he, he doesn't have an exact definition for it, but yet now we, he's getting an idea of how things work. So this is interesting that it was discovered that if you take a magnet and pass it across a conductor like a wire in a loop, you get, uh, you get a current, you get an electric current, you can get a shock from that. All right, so he then, he, but uh, the funny thing is, is that Michael Faraday himself was no mathematician. He regarded himself not even as that. It was something that was very difficult for him. But yet, and he, uh, and, but yet he, was, he had an incredible way of actually visualizing things. Um, the next thing he did is he went along in about 1845, about 14 years later, he then discovered that with polarized light, now firmly established as a concept. So if you take polarized light, and apply a strong magnet to it, the light can be rotated by the polar, by the magnet. So light can be rotated in the presence of a magnet. So Michael Faraday is saying, well, there's, there's just got to be this enormous connection between electric fields and magnetic fields and light. There must be some kind of connection because look at this, I can rotate a polarized beam of light by applying a magnet to it. It's called Faraday rotation. It was discovered in 1845. Well, 1846 comes along, he starts really getting his head around this stuff, and he visualizes a concept of the nature of how light propagates. He doesn't think of it as propagating through a medium. What he instead thinks of it is the medium itself, are, he describes field lines. So you can say, well, there's a source, and the source affects something at a distance. So there's a line that is, a, that is maybe the electric field. And the, the source has an electric field. You can detect it by placing test particles or whatever in various places. You can detect its strength by placing test things near an electric source. Um, that's why, you know, if you have a magnet, you can say, well, if I, how close do I bring the magnet? So you can change the magnet, magnet's location as you move it, and it'll induce different currents. It's not the same current. If the, if the, if the magnetic magnet is like 10 feet away, it won't induce the same current as if it's right next to it. So that implies that there's a strength of the field. And so Michael Faraday visualized this field as a series of lines emanating out from the source, either a magnetic source or an electric source. And he envisioned that, the, that light itself was not traveling in, say, water or something like that, but instead was a disturbance of these field lines. So the, light, the field lines extended out and when light was transmitted, it, it changed the field, and it was a change in field lines and a disturbance in there, or vibrations on these field lines, and that's what he considered to be the nature of light, is a vibration on field lines. It's a wave. It has wavelength. It has a distance. It has an amplitude, and so you can think of it as plucking a string. So the field lines themselves would go from source to destination, and the disturbance in them is a pluck. 
and that makes a that makes a wavelength. So it's a very interesting idea. And in fact, if you look at introductory uh, introductory uh, electromagnetic textbooks or even gravity textbooks, you see the concept of the field line. And this was developed by Michael Faraday as a helpful visual tool for us to understand things. In fact, a lot of people still use this as a dominant way of teaching the concept of an electric field. And we still use the word electric field that Michael Faraday came up with. All right. So what's fascinating is that so Michael Faraday even went even further to say that nothing actually feels the source. It only feels the field that the source creates. So he then said, well, what his a classic argument in utilizing gravity as an idea is that what if you took the Earth or what if the sun didn't have any planets around it at all and magically, boom, you drop the Earth in its proper place? What would it do? How would it behave? You say, well, it would have to behave according to the, gra the field lines that are present as a result of the sun. So you don't even need to have the test particle there, meaning the earth, meaning an electron, meaning something that actually generate that senses the field in order for the field to be there. The field is just there waiting to be accessed. That was his argument, and that kind of helps us visualize the nature of what we mean by an electrical field or a magnetic field. So it's a fascinating thing that it's there, that it's present, and that disturbances in it are what we call light. And that's a, it, it, his idea was, was powerful visually and helped a lot of people understand things, and in fact is used today extensively. All right. But remember that, that Faraday was a visual idea thinker and wasn't a mathematician. So he had a, couldn't put it in a way that could be manipulated, uh, in, manipulated quantitatively very well. All right, so then coming up, a pro, just under 20 years later, in 1864, James Clerk Maxwell created the mathematical links that then solidified everything that we know about electricity and magnetism. He created and linked together four equations, starting with Michael Faraday's induction equation, which he set down as a mathematical treatise that related the current to a moving magnet. And so if there's a current, there must have been a moving magnet. And then he also took Carl Friedrich Gauss's equations that, that governed the electric field and governed the magnetic field, uh, that these things existed. And so Carl Friedrich Gauss's two equations he pulled in. And then finally, he pulled in André-Marie Ampere's law, which then said that a magnetic field is created by a changing electric field or by a steady current, a steady electric current. So. Ampere's law combined with Gauss's law of electric fields and Gauss's law of magnetic fields and Faraday's law of induction, they became James Clerk Maxwell's four laws of electromagnetism. And so Maxwell is considered the granddaddy of all this by taking these disparate ideas, formalizing them mathematically, putting them together, and showing how they're all interrelated. So these four equations link the electric field, the magnetic field, currents, changing currents, position in space, posi changes in time to all of these things. All these things are all interlinked. And so if you solve the equations for, say, a simple wave equation, in fact, you could actually put them together and say, well, how does a wave equation fall out of this? And uh, James Clerk Maxwell's equations allow for a wave solution for them. And a wave solution simply means is that there is a disturbance inside a field and it propagates. And so how does it propagate? It propagates through space at a given rate, which means it propagates at some speed. And the funny thing is, is that Clark Maxwell said, well, there's these two constants that are endemic inside of the, in, uh, two physical constants that are measurables that are part of his four equations. And one of them is the permeability of free space of biomagnetic field. And another one is, is the permittivity of, uh, of a permittivity of, of a permittivity and permissivity of magnetic fields and electric fields in free space. And so it measures just how easy it is for an electric field to make it through space and how easy it is for magnetic field, electric fields and magnetic fields to make it through space. So it's a measure of how the effectiveness is because as you, take an, uh, as you take a magnet and move it closer, a uh, moving magnet, move it closer to a current, it doesn't all of a sudden, just, there is a way that it does that. It's not that it, you could change the rate at which it does it, 
but there is a, a there's a definite translation constant or a number that says well if I'm moving it this fast then that's how much current we're going to get over here and it's always the same no matter who does the experiment so these are universal constants and if you combine these two constants about the permissivity and permittivity of electric and magnetic fields in space he found he get he found he got the speed with which the electromagnetic disturbance passed through space. And that, he said, was strikingly close to the speed of light as measured experimentally during the course of, uh, around the time. So he said, this is too close to be a thing, and it's very well shown by, by Faraday rotation that light and electromagnetism are all one thing. So therefore, light must be the thing that we call a disturbance in the electromagnetic field. So this is an amazing deduction that, that he did. He took all these experimentally derived things and linked them together in one coherent thought, or four coherent thoughts, and said, these are the sources of electric fields, the sources of magnetic fields, how they interact with each other, and then derive a wave equation from them, relatively simply, it's what you do in first quarter electromagnetism in a college class, and what you eventually find is that the speed with which the wave propagates equals the speed of light. And in fact, it was looked at more and more carefully and said, yes, this is exactly the speed of light. So this is a fascinating thing. How fast do the disturbances move? They move at the speed of light. So therefore, the disturbances in electric magnetic fields is light. That's a really crazy thought. So what is, happens? What's happening when you move a magnet next to a current? Light's being exchanged. That's what it is. Virtual particles or particles of light are being exchanged. What's their wavelength? Why don't we see them? Okay. This is a very fascinating concept. So all wavelengths then, uh, Clerk Maxwell found that, Maxwell found that inside this wave equation there wasn't any restriction on the wavelengths of light. So they could be anything. It just so happened that visual wavelengths are very, that's a very narrow region. It's a very small set, subset of all possible wavelengths. So he said, well, there's got to be other wavelengths of light. There must be. And in fact, there had been known to be other wavelengths of light. You remember, he did his work in 1864. But back in 1800, Sir William Herschel had discovered infrared light. And William Herschel discovered infrared light, which we'll talk about more when we talk about infrared telescopes, but William Herschel discovered infrared light by putting a thermometer in a box under a, after a prism broke out all the light, and then found that the sunlight that was not hit, was, where it was dark inside the box, the, the light was actually, the thermometer was actually raising in darkness. So and to the same amount that the thermometers raised in the presence of the beam of light as, as was spread out by a prism. So since it was past the red, it was in a dark region that he couldn't see, but yet it behaved as though it was getting illuminated. He called it infrared light. Also, in 1888, just a, just a few short years after Maxwell published his equations, radio wavelengths were discovered by Heinrich Hertz. And then X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895, and in 1900, gamma rays were discovered. So it was all wavelengths were possible, and, made, and they were quickly discovered after and when, as technology arose to allow them to be discovered. So then it becomes a fascinating, real question. There's this speed of light. That's how fast light is transferring. Well, here's the funny thing. Speed with respect to what? Really, what's it have this, because it's just a speed in there. And the electromagnetic equations say that it's going at this speed. Also, notice that if we think about all the ways people talk about light, they always, in some way, assume some sort of medium in which light is traversing. So light must traverse using some kind of medium. And uh, even though Michael Faraday said, well, there's no such thing as a medium, there's just these field lines, um, everybody thought that there must be some medium in which light propagates. And so in the latter part of the 19th century, the greatest effort was to determine this medium, and it was called the ether. And the ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, means just some other element. It's Aristotle's putative fifth element. Uh, there's earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And that was Aristotle's concept of, of, of the nature of light. 
So what's fascinating is that the, uh, but nobody knew what it traversed in. What does light traverse in? And we'll get to that next time. See it? Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. This whole sequence that I've been doing recently about the nature of the history of the discovery of what light is certainly doesn't seem to be a lot about astronomy. But let's actually take understand one very important thing. Remember, the moon is 200,000 miles away. The sun is 93 million miles away. Jupiter is, not, is five times the distance between the Earth and the sun. And the stars are light years away. So we're never going to touch these objects. So what we need to do is we need to understand how light works because that's our messenger. That's how we know what's going on. So if, if somehow light interacts with material, which we know it does, then we, and then we need to understand how light interacts with material because if it interacts, maybe it carries that information to us. So we need to understand as much as we can about this thing that we call light so that we can actually determine what the thing that, do, that happened to the light when it reflected or sourced off that distant material. So let's continue our quest to understand the nature of light. All right, so last time we ended up with James Clerk Maxwell's equations for the electro electromagnetism and how they are, can be solved to show that light is actually a propagation of an electromagnetic wave. And that just determines, that pretty much said that any light can be any, any wavelength, uh, basic, as long and any frequency, but the frequency and wavelength of light are related by the speed of light. So the thing is, is there's two questions. Well, what's the speed of light and what's it moving in? So everyone, every theory of light that deals with any kind of wave motion assumes some sort of medium, like water waves, you can't have waves in water without water. You can't have waves in, uh, can't have sound waves in air without air. So you need to have some sort of, logically, you've got to have some sort of medium in which to traverse light. And anybody who said otherwise in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century was looked at as kind of crazy. But specifically in the latter part of the 19th century, because here's what happened. This thing that we would call the medium of light was called, was termed the luminiferous ether. That's a wonderful word, luminiferous ether. And it just basically meant a, a, a material in which light propagated, but that nothing else dealt with. Like, it wasn't affected by matter at all. The luminiferous ether went through us, it went past us. It kind of was like the force from Star Wars or something like that. It just, it was everywhere. And so, but it did nothing to anything except light. Um, so this was fascinating as a concept and, and people thought, well, it's kind of an odd thing because the Earth is moving in its orbit around the Sun. So as the Earth moves, it must be moving through this ether. Okay, so we also, we knew from Galileo that if you move through something, you can see a relative motion of things. And that's an interesting thought. So we also thought that, well, maybe the moon, the, the, there is a, that the, on the Earth, that this luminiferous ether does not have like turbulent winds. Otherwise, we might see light bouncing around in strange patterns. So we could assume that the, the luminiferous ether was relatively steady or constant throughout the cosmos and that the Earth simply moved through it. And so in a certain sense, we would look at the luminiferous ether as, as a fixed reference system. It is the thing of the cosmos and that light travels through. This became kind of a mainstay of 19th century figure, physics. So people went about to saying, well, I want to know how fast the Earth is moving through the luminiferous, luminiferous ether. And to see, and, and therefore, if it must be moving, then we should be able to detect this movement. And how shall we detect this movement? Well, it's kind of simple. It was devised in 1887 by Albert Michelson and Edward Morley, and they created what was called an interferometer. And they took a bright source of light, and they pointed it in one direction and bounced it through a whole series of mirrors back and forth. And they took the same source of light. And before they bounced it through this series, they made a, like a special mirror, a half-silvered mirror. So the light went through one side of the mirror, some of it went to the right, and some of it went straight through. That's a half-silvered mirror. So a, a mirror that passes half, partly through and partly against. In that same sense, it, 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 you can look at, say, 
uh, a, a window facing outside as a half silvered mirror because you can both see your reflection in the window and see things outside given, given proper conditions. So maybe you just want to formalize this to make sure that you get half the light going through and half the light going through, uh, half the light transmitting and the other half reflecting. And so that's a special setup of glass. And so in 1887, Michelson and Mori were able to create such a glass. And what they did is they had a bright source of light that went through this half silvered mirror and bounced around on another series of mirrors before coming back through the half, to the half silvered mirror and going off to a detector. Meanwhile, they had another thing that was, through, that was 90 degrees away from that. So there's one group of light bouncing going like this and another going 90 degrees like that. So basically they extended, it's as though they, they had went through the half silvered mirror, went down a long series of things and said like they folded it by having all these bouncing mirrors. So it's like they had a very long travel, travel space for the light to go this way back and forth and a very long travel to, uh, distance to go this way. So it was an extremely long distance that they traveled, that the light traveled, and then it got recombined. So as it went back through the half silvered mirror, it went over here and put, got, was detected on a detector. Now, remember the superposition principle. The superposition principle says that if two waves meet and they have the same, at, the, at one point, and their waves are in phase, then they, the amplitudes add. In fact, Amplitudes always add, but sometimes if they're if they're in this if they're in phase, then they add and they become twice as big. So if they have the same amplitude here when they meet, it's twice as high. But if they meet and they're out of phase, say by 90 degrees, then when they meet, there's nothing because they cancel each other out. And this happens in water waves, and it was known to also happen in light waves. That's the diffraction effect, and the, the also well specifically Young's double slit experiment in 1803 showed that to be the case. So. So therefore, we knew that this kind of effect occurred and they were going to capitalize on it. They said, okay, we can actually look for this interference pattern of the superposition of these things and let's time it and tune it so that the initial impulse is that they're either in phase or out of phase. And what they did is they said, okay, let's set up the apparatus so that the light goes down one traverse and goes down the other, and they bounce and recombine. And maybe what you want to do is then tune the distances so they're exactly the same and you make like, maybe you make it so it's out of phase, completely out of phase and you get no signal. Great. So now all you have to do is wait, is you wait for the earth to rotate. You wait for the earth to move through space. And if the earth is moving, through space and therefore through the luminiferous ether, the speed will cause a wind. There will be an ether wind and the wind will have the light. If it's going into the wind, the light will struggle to go into the wind just in the same way a bird struggles to fly into the wind and it will struggle to go into the wind and then it'll come back faster and that will push, but the light going across won't have the same problem. So the phases, the two beams of light that are 90 degrees apart, one of them will be more into the wind than the other. And so therefore, you should see an interference pattern. So you make it so that there is none. You set it up and then you take trial after trial, time after time. You rotate the entire apparatus as you go, as at various times in the year around the Earth, as the Earth goes around the orbit, around the sun. And they checked and checked and checked for an appearance of the dot. And what did they find? Nothing. It didn't matter where the Earth's orbit, Earth was in its orbit. It didn't matter which way they oriented the, the apparatus. They found no interference pattern. They found no positive, after they calibrated it, they found no change. So there was zero effect, which meant that there was no ether wind. Therefore, you couldn't, there was no adding of the speed of the Earth of, onto the light as it went into the luminif luminiferous ether. Because if the light was going this way and the Earth was going that way, you'd add their two speeds together and the Earth, don't, you don't add the speed of the light going that's traversed to it. But if you're going with it, you add the speed together. So therefore, they should have had a difference, but they never did. So the luminiferous ether was disproved in all at once 
but in 1887 by Michelson and Morley looking for the effect of the luminiferous ether, meaning looking for the change in speed of light through time as the Earth moved through this theorized, this putative, this imagined luminiferous ether, and they discovered that it didn't exist. That's an amazing discovery. So, okay, so that, that's kind of a weird thought. So they said, well, what's the speed? We said, well, what's the speed of light? Well, let's take a step back and look at the speed of light because when we find that, there, that the speed of light, basically they, what Michelson Morley found was that the speed of light was constant no matter which way you looked. Fascinating. Didn't matter which way you looked, the speed of light was constant. It was always the same. Whether it was going across the movement or with the movement or kitty corner to the movement, didn't matter. The speed of light was the same. Really fascinating. Okay, so what is the speed of light thing? Let's take it back. Let's take it way back. So 1638, way, way back then, Galileo, remember him? Galileo actually tried to measure the speed of light. He tried to measure the speed of light by putting people with lanterns on top of hilltops, miles apart, and so he would say, okay, well, I'm gonna open my lantern, and when you see it, you open your lantern, and I'll time it. I'm gonna time it with my, my heartbeat. That's all he had in 1638. And to him, with people miles apart, he couldn't find any difference. In fact, it was too fast for his heartbeat. In fact, it was more like the, it, it was about at the same time as it took for someone to actually lift it. It was about a heartbeat or so. So from his measurements, he said, if it's not infinite, it's really fast. That's a pretty good measurement for Galileo in 1638. Very smart. In 1676, just about 30 years later, for, uh, in, yeah, 40 years later, Ole Romer, using telescopes, uh, actually determined that the speed of light had to be very fast and he actually made a measurement of the speed of light. How he did it was he was timing the transit of the Galilean satellites because people thought well we should use the Galilean satellites as a natural clock because if you're out on the ocean you might be able to use them as a clock by observing the timing transits and that would help you with finding say longitude. So the timing of the transits of the Galilean satellites around Jupiter can be used as a clock. All right, so then you could make a prediction as to when, on what day, at exactly what time these transits should occur. And what Romer found was that they were different than the predictions. So you knew that it took only so many days for Io to go around, and you knew it only took so many days for Callisto and Ganymede and Europa to go around. So why were you observing them at the wrong time? And that happened because the cumulative effect of the Earth's orbit around the sun added times to the travel time because the light took extra time to travel to the location you're at now as opposed to the location you were at. So that added time to the measurement and it's, a, it's an increase in time as you travel around the orbit. It's not all at once. It's not like, okay, now we're at this distance. No, it's a cumulative effect of errors in measurement as a result of when the light left Jupiter and when it was received. So as these cumulative effects add up, they add up in one way as you're going, as Earth is going towards Jupiter, and they subtract as you come as Earth is going away from Jupiter. So they kind of go in a cyclical pattern, but by measuring the transit timings, or the sum of all the transit differentials that occurred between the timings of the, of, of the transits of Io, you could determine just how long it took for the Earth to go, for light to travel, the diameter of Earth's orbit. And what Ole Romer found was that if you add up all these transit time, uh, these transit timing errors, that ends up being, well, if you think about the entire diameter of the Earth's orbit, he deduced that there was, that the speed of light, because the diameter divided by the speed uh, and the timing transits, shall, he said, that I think it was roughly about 22 minutes, so he was off by a bit. Uh, to, the total, total discrepancy was 22 minutes across, or throughout the year, meaning how much, how much increase and decrease it was from the expected value. And so from that, he determined if it's 93 million miles times two, which is 150 million miles, uh, yeah, 100, 200 million miles, then he determined roughly that the speed of light is 200,000 kilometers per second, which is pretty close. It's very fast, but pretty close. But he used the, the errors in the timing of transits of, of Europa or Io around, 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 uh, around Jupiter. All right, so that was a good measurement. And in 1728, 50 years later, remember James Bradley measuring stellar aberration, trying to find parallax, but found aberration. The only way that he could account for the fact that the, the telescope was moving 
and that the light would have to instead, it have to, the pitch of the telescope had to be changed in order for the, the apparent position of the light to be in the correct place, he determined that the speed of light had to be about 300,000 kilometers per second in order for it to work. All right, so that's James, that's James Bradley since 1728. In 1850, Hippolyte Fisso and Leon Foucault used the difference in speeds of light in air and water as they bounce, as uh, when they took a beam of light, bounced it off of a rotating mirror, passed it through light, passed it through water, then that light went to a very distant mirror, bounced off that, came back to the rotating mirror, distant meaning miles away, bounced back off this rotating mirror that may have changed position uh, and, and uh, basically had teeth in it or marks. And so there were only specific places when the bouncing could occur. And then uh, by the change in position, the, when it passed through the light, uh, passed back to the detector right next to the source, they could use the change in path length combined with the, uh, the rotation of the mirror, which was like a sawtooth, and so it would only bounce off of specific teeth. That would actually tell them the speed of light. And so Fizeau and Foucault determined in 1850 the speed of light this way. And then finally, the speed of light in about 1900 was determined by Lewis Essen and A.G. Gordon Smith uh, by, using electron by using electronics. And what they used was called a cavity, a cavity resonance wave, wave meter. And that's basically an electric circuit that has an oscillating pattern. And that oscillating pattern is inside of a physical, diam physical space. And that physical space, if you have a wave that's oscillating inside a physical space, you must have standing wavelengths. Just like on a guitar string that when it gets plucked, the ends of the guitar string are stuck to the guitar. So therefore you have standing waves on the guitar string. In the same sense, in this oscillating resonance wave meter, you have standing wavelengths of light. So you know what the frequency is in order to make the standing wavelengths occur inside of there. And then you just measure the size of the wave meter, which is really small, but yet you say it must be an integral number of waves inside of there. And through that, they were able to measure the speed of light. And that is one of the more modern measurements, and it gets you about 299,000 kilometers per second, very close to 300,000 kilometers per second. And this is a very close to a very modern way of actually measuring these speeds by looking at cavity resonance measurements in any event. So the speed of light then had been well established and well understood all the way up through 1887. And when Michelson and Morley found, well, wait a second, what is this speed of light? And they found it was independent. And this is the key idea out of the Michelson-Morley experiment is that the speed of light was completely independent of the direction in which you were looking, uh, which you were making your measurement. Now they should have seen some sort of addition or subtraction to the speed of light, given that the Earth was moving through the luminiferous ether. And since it was moving through it, the light should have at the, wave, at the waves in the ether, we should have been either catching up to the waves or receding away from the waves. And that did not occur. So therefore, the luminiferous ether as a thing could not exist. Ah, that's a crazy thought. That's a big, big, big thought. And that actually was solved by this guy named Albert Einstein, which we'll talk about next time. Hello, my name is Jason Kendall and welcome to yet another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we discussed something very interesting which was called the Michelson-Morley experiment. And the Michelson-Morley experiment attempted to find the uh, medium in which light traveled. So let's see really why that had to exist and why the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment gave rise to this thing that we call special relativity and general relativity. So let's take a couple steps back and review exactly where the paradox came from and the dilemma that's forcing the existence of relativity. All right, so first, let's go back and look at Sir Isaac Newton's mechanics. So uh, Isaac Newton supposes throughout his entire idea of how the, the world works, the Newtonian mechanics assumes an absolute space and an absolute time. Meaning, if you look at any one of the equations, there's no time for you, time for me, this is the time. No, he just says the time. And the time means there is, a, purportedly, some clock 
in the universe that is permeates the entire universe through which time progresses uh, step by step, second by second, hour by hour. So what then is time? It is this marching progression of clocks that are the same everywhere in the entire universe. Likewise, uh, Newton uh, postulated the existence of an absolute space. An absolute space means that it's just kind of our way of thinking about space is that it's a very, very simple thing to think that space just is and there's an absolute reference frame for space, meaning that you go left, right, backwards, forwards, up and down and however you wish to move in space. So. According to Newton's ideas, space, uh, you, you are inexorably dragged forward in space, but you can move around however you like, uh, dragged forward in time in one direction, but you can, you're free to move backwards left and right, which is kind of like forwards and back in space. Um, the equivalent way of thinking about it is we can't go backwards in time. In the same way, uh, just imagine that we said the following thing. It's kind of a cute uh, linguistic trick. But imagine that we had the same limits to one of our spatial dimensions that we apparently do with one of our time dimensions. Okay, so imagine that we could only go right, that there is no left in this. So we can go forward and back in time, pretend that, that'd be kind of weird. But then as a cost for that, imagine we could only go up or down, forwards and backwards, and right. Imagine that the concept of leftedness, going left, that you couldn't do it. And people would say, oh my goodness, I want to go left in space. Well, you can never go left in space, that's the thing. Uh, because you can't go left in space. It's a fundamental physical law. But you can go forwards and back in time, but you can't go left in space. That's kind of what we're talking about. It's kind of this very strange absurdity. So, but let's see what we really mean, but let's see some other implications of this. Um, when Newtonian mechanics lives, then you can have simultaneous events. Simultaneous events means two things happening separated in space that happen at the same time. That's simultaneity. And so we can think of two heartbeats separated by a few miles. It's a very romantic notion. Uh, we can think of two people seeing the moon in the sky at the same time. We can think of, of two, car, uh, two cars um, driving down two different highways and passing, uh, a, a, uh, we can say they turn on the radios at the same time. So there's lots of ways of things you can think about it being simultaneous, meaning things that happen is separated by either small distances or very large distances that apparently happen at the same time. All right, so another way we can then think about the nature of absolute space and time is how Newton thought about it. Newton said that feeling of acceleration, that inertia, the concept of inertia is, a, is, is when you are accelerating with respect to absolute space. So as you accelerate with respect to absolute space, you experience this thing called inertia because it's a resistance to acceleration. All right, another way of looking at it is if you, and Newton actually did this himself, he called it the rotation of a water in a bucket. So if you rotate, take a, uh, take a bucket of water and rotate it, the water knows to go to the edge of the bucket. Why? Because it's moving with respect to absolute space. Or at least that's how Newton thought about it, is that it was a rotating frame. And so since it's rotating with respect to the entire universe, Therefore, with respect to all of absolute space and time, and those philosophers out there know this is an interesting and very thorny thing to talk about, but then the rotation of the bucket with the water in it as it goes out to the side, he said, ah, so therefore, this is a rotation with respect to the known universe, and so it knows that. And so that's rotation. Um, finally, uniform motion then is therefore indiscernible inside of absolute space and time. What does that mean? Well, this goes back to Galileo's idea, and Galileo's idea of having the little per the people inside the ship. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But uniform motion in space and time, we've already known is indiscernible. So if you are inside a car driving down a straight highway at 80 miles an hour, you know, Highway 80 in New Jersey, just so the state troopers don't get you, but in any event, um, you're driving down a straight highway, you're going fast, and you throw a ball up and down like a juggler would. The ball goes up, goes straight up, and falls straight down. 
Now, you can't tell that you're moving fat 80 miles an hour straight forward until you look outside the car window. But even then, you don't know, unless, well, you know because, you know, it's experience, but it could be that the entire universe is rushing past you at 80 miles an hour and you are standing still. You can't tell the difference between the two. Now, from the outside, looking into the car, as you throw the ball up and juggle, the, the juggling ball apparently goes up and down forward. It stays inside the car, so tracking its plot by looking at how it moves from outside, it makes an arc. It goes up and comes down. So a very simple idea is it kind of goes up like that and down like that, but we know there's a parabolic arc because it's a throw and there's gravity, etc., etc., but let's ignore that for just a second. So the ball does not do a straight up and down move if you watch it from the side as it goes by because if the ball had moved straight up and down as you threw it, then it would be behind the car. It's not. So the, add, the, velocity, the speeds with which things move add. So in, we, this all comes back to this concept of what we will call an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of, re inertial frame of reference, dun 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 dun. Uh, it is a, a frame of reference that where you lay down a whole bunch of sticks and clocks inside a room such as this one and you put meter sticks everywhere and nobody can quite move because everything's lined with meter sticks and twigs and branches and stuff. But the, on the intersection of every little twig and branch there's a little clock and all the clocks inside this frame are all set to be the same. And so a, a, room, a small room is actually a good way of thinking about it. So a laboratory in which you may do experiments. You can put clocks all throughout the room and synchronize those clocks inside that room. You can also lay down measuring sticks inside that room and that will give you measurements of distance and measurements of time all throughout that room. And no matter how that room moves, those clocks and those sticks will stay the same. That's what we mean by an inertial frame of reference. Now, you don't feel any push to the side or pull to the side. That would be a non-inertial frame. Say somebody puts that room like in a merry-go-round. It swings around and around and around. Then it's no longer inertial because you feel a push towards the side of the wall. Now, we're strictly speaking not in an inertial frame because we're in a gravitational field, so you have a preferred reference, which is down. So let's take this inertial frame and set it way out in space so everything inside that room is floating. So you got a whole bunch of floating critters and nobody's bolted down and the sticks are all the same, the, the room is small and the clocks are everywhere all the same and so all those synced up. That's what we mean by an inertial frame. And so if you then move that inertial frame fast in one direction and it's all inside one speed, everything's moving left because we like the word left, we eliminated it from space and time, but now we're adding it back. So it's moving to the left with respect to some observer. And then people do experiments inside the room. What do you see inside the room? You see all the normal laws of physics, all of them. And if you choose to be outside and look at them, you see most of the normal laws, but all the speeds are added together. That's the nature of an inertial frame of reference. All right, well, of course, we talked about that a long time ago. With Ga in a previous lecture with Galileo. Because Galileo came up with this concept of relativity as well, and he's, he, 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 he po posited the idea that all inertial frames are the same. They're all equal. And how did that, what does that mean? Every single inertial frame in the universe is the same. That's an interesting statement. So if you have an inertial frame and it's moving, the laws of physics you measure inside that inertial frame are the same as if you were in any other inertial frame doing any other kind of uniform motion, non-accelerating, non-rotating motion. So you can't tell the difference between one inertial frame and the other. You, let's say you have two, two of these rooms and they're approaching each other really fast. They're going to miss, but they're going to miss. They're going to go by each other. Each of them, there's a relative speed. Maybe they're going really fast like like thousand miles an hour or something and they're going by each other inside the one that's going to the left they'll see all the rules and laws of physics and everything like that will be the same here and then the one going to the right would also see the same laws of physics as it goes to the, its direction so all laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame okay we're almost there so now Maxwell's equations come along 
And when Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism are assembled, he, they don't fit with those other two ideas. They don't fit with the inertial frames idea, and they don't fit with the absolute time and space idea. It doesn't fit. And why? Because all speeds are relative, according to Newton and Galileo. All of them. All speeds are relative. Okay, cars going by, people in ships going smooth on oceans, all of them. And in Newtonian mechanics, a speed's just add. So when the inertial frame is going by a thousand miles an hour, and let's say you choose to throw a ball inside the inertial frame forward at 10 miles an hour, the speed with which the ball is going to an outside observer is 1,000 miles an hour plus 10, which is 1,010 miles an hour. That's if the inertial frame is going by you at 1,000 miles an hour. So in Newtonian mechanics, all speeds add. And also, all speeds are relative inside Newtonian mechanics and Galilean relativity. Well, here's the problem. Maxwell found in his equations of electromagnetism, which were determined experimentally, experimentally determined things, in postulated um, e, uh, in inertial reference frames. Well, inertial is best you can get inside of the Earth's gravitational field, but we'll ignore the Earth's gravitational field for now and call a reference frame on the ground inertial-ish, okay? He found that if you solve the equations and determine a speed, uh, that there's that a wave equation can fall out of the of the four equations for Maxwell's rel Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, that a wave equation can fall out. And the speed of that wave equation depends on two experimentally verified constants. One is the permittivity of the vacuum or free space, and the other is the permissivity of, of the vacuum or free space. So the permittivity is for the electric field, and the per permittivity is for the magnetic field. And these things, these two constants, were related to the amount of charge or current and the force that was then pushed against things. So. They were measurables. So they said, how much charge do we have? Uh, what's the force that we feel on a test charge? Okay, fine. There's a conversion factor, and that conversion factor is the epsilon, which is, which is the permittivity of free space. And let's say you have a magnetic field, and that, is the, uh, that goes with the Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force shows that if you move, a, uh, move charges through a magnetic field, you get a force. So now, that per those two constants combined together uh, are there, if you multiply those two constants and take their square root and their reciprocal, you get the speed of light identically, identically. So inside of the wave equation, the solution for Maxwell's laws in a wave equation gives the speed of light, not relative to anything else, just a speed. So wait a second, now we got a problem. And what's the problem? The problem is Maxwell's equations say that there is a speed, and that speed is the speed of light. Okay, but Newtonian mechanics says that speeds add, and Galilean relativity says all inertial frames are the same. So now we are at the crux of a problem, and the problem is Newtonian mechanics, uh, which says that there's an absolute space and an absolute time. And Galilean relativity, which says that all inertial reference frames are equal, and Maxwell's laws, which state that with, after you go through them all, say that there's an absolute speed, and a, an absolute speed called the speed of light that's derived from experimentally derived values. So you've got three things, and you can only have two of them. That's the problem. They're in conflict because the speed of light don't add. But that's what Maxwell suggested to Michelson and Morley in our lecture from last time. That's what Maxwell said, hey guys, why don't you go, it's kind of a loose suggestion, but the idea is that the community, the scientific community said this whole thing, and Maxwell, I believe, even stated as such to them. It's like, this, this speed needs to be known. And if the speed of light is what it is, then the speeds must add if we're moving through a medium. Okay, now last time we learned that the Michelson-Morley experiment did not find any change in the speed of light with respect to any movement of the Earth around the Sun, how it moved, what time of year, when they did the experiment, how the orientation of the experiment, 
they could find no change at all. So therefore, the speed of light did, so because, well, it's a, because what was the ether? The ether that they, Michelson and Morley were trying to, dis, were trying to measure would have been that ultimate reference frame that Newton demanded. Newton said there's an absolute time and an absolute space, and the ether would have represented that because of the speed of light being constant inside of the inside of Maxwell's equations. So, the discovery that the speed of light is a constant no matter how you move violates either the, uh, the inertial reference frame, meaning you've got to get rid of, you got to play with Newton's laws, or you've got to play with, you got to play with Maxwell's laws and say only if you're moving in a particular, particular way do they work, or you keep Maxwell's laws and you do something else. And we'll see what that something else is next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Well, last time we talked about the nature of the Galilean relativity versus Newtonian mechanics versus Maxwell's laws of electric electromagnetism, and we learned that they actually were incompatible with each other. So let's actually put a little bit more in. Uh, let's put a little bit more into that and see what the resolution is in modern physics. All right. So Galilean relativity once again says that all inertial frames are all inertial inertial frames are equal, meaning you don't know whether or not you're moving inside of an inertial frame. You feel like you're at rest inside of an inertial frame. An inertial frame, once again, is something that's not accelerating, not decelerating, they're the same thing really, but we'll just say that, or rotating or anything like that. An inertial frame is one that's either at rest or moving at a uniform velocity. All right. So next is that Galilean relativity implied the addition of speeds, meaning one thing moving in one direction, the speed is added from one thing on top of another. So in, let's say, you have a very, you're on Galileo's great boat and you decide to shoot an arrow forward uh, off the bow, the speed with which the arrow goes forward off the bow is, is the sum of the speed of the arrow that is launched from the bow and the speed on from the deck of the ship as the ship is moving. So the ship might be moving, say, uh, two, uh, 10 kilometers an hour or something like that, and then the arrow might be moving 100 kilometers, uh, 100 meters per second or something like that, something really fast. So then you just add those two speeds. Now, if you're firing off the, off the stern, you subtract the speed of the arrow, and then, but that's what we mean by relative speed. And for the person on the boat, though, they see the arrow going 100 meters per second forward, whereas somebody off the boat watching sees the two speeds add. And that's what we mean by Galilean relativity, is that depending on the observer, either the speeds add or they subtract. So it's relative to the observer, and it's the simplest version of relativity. Anyway, the next thing that came about was, was Newtonian mechanics. And Newtonian mechanics, and all of their works, uh, he posits the existence of momentum. He posits the existence of equal action. He posits the existence of the gravitational field. He posits all these things and summarizes them very simply. But the funny thing is with all of, of, all of Newton's laws is that he assumes that the time, meaning capital T, capital T, the time, is universal across the entire universe. And that space in which actions occur is different than the actions in which they do occur. So an action cannot affect space or time in any way, and time is the same everywhere across the cosmos. That's what we mean by an absolute space and an absolute time. It's simply a framework in which everything happens, and so time marches forward everywhere equally in the universe, according to Newton. All right. That, and that's kind of how we think about things today in our everyday life. That's exactly how we think of it, too. All right, so the next thing, then, is Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism. He was a, this was an experimentally derived set of, set of laws. They weren't derived from first principles. They were derived from experiments, numerous experiments, all four of the laws. And one of the important outcomes of, new, of, the, of Maxwell's laws is that there are solutions to the equations that look like waves. 
And so those waves have the propagation speed of the speed of light. So Maxwell said, ah, those are the speed of light, and that, so that is the speed with which light moves. And so therefore, light is simply a propagation of an electromagnetic wave. All right, so here's the interesting thing. The speed of light enters into Maxwell's equations as a constant, as a conversion factor, as just something that sits there. It doesn't say speed with respect to anything, it just says speed. So that's a big conflict. And you can already see that that rubs up against uh, Galileo's uh, addition of speeds. He said, oh, okay, so, all right. So Galileo would say, I take a flashlight and I point it forward from the bow of my ship. And let's say my ship is going very, 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 very fast. The bow of my ship might be moving, my ship might be moving very fast. And for an outside observer, I see, when I point my flashlight forward, I see the light go out in front of me at the speed of light. To, according to Galileo, then an observer that's on the land watching this speedy boat go by, shooting a light beam going forward, we should, he, according to Galileo, that light beam should be going at the speed of light plus the speed of the boat. All right. Well, here's the interesting thing. Remember we talked about Michelson-Morley experiment last time. The Michelson-Morley experiment was that. That what is what it was. And we found that no matter what direction we looked at and found, looked, looked for to see the speed of light, we found the speed of light was the same in every direction, no matter our movement, no matter what orientation we're looking at, no matter how we observe it, no matter what. So the speed of light, according to Michelson-Morley, was is absolutely um, is 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 a constant, which is what Maxwell's equation said. Okay, so we got a tension there, and that's kind of weird because we do know that in Galileo's world, that if we have you know if you take a bowling ball or an arrow, yeah, the speeds add, but why doesn't the speed of light add? That's an odd thing. So, but Michael's but Maxwell's equations say they do. Okay, well, say or, or imply that they should. So, that, but then experimentally it's shown that they don't. All right, so then there's the third thing, which is Newtonian mechanics. And Newtonian mechanics posits that there is an absolute space and an absolute time. But wait a second, speeds are simply distances as a function of time. How fast is this thing going? How many meters does it cover per second? Well, that's a concept that we would call that's also called, that we would call speed. And so speeds are inherent to that. So Galilean relativity shows about addition of speeds. Uh, Maxwell's equation shows a constant speed, a specific speed that's associated with a specific thing, light. But Newtonian mechanics says, no, no, no. There is only one time and only one space. Well, this, this is a problem. Because if you posit that there must be an absolute time and space, then Galileo's idea of relativity must be wrong. But apparently, we have found that according to experiment, that it's right. So here's what was done in 1905. The, these mutually exclusive ideas had a great tension and nobody really knew what to do with them until Einstein came along and created what he called the special relativity. And special relativity said, okay, here's what we're gonna say to resolve this problem. We're going to say that all inertial frames are equal. We'll keep Galileo's idea that if you're in an inertial frame, all the physical laws are the same, th speeds add inside the frame, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, all in, and if, as long as you're not accelerating or decelerating, you're in an inertial frame. If you're not rotating, decelerating, or accelerating, you're in one. Okay, then what he did is he decided to then say, Maxwell's equations are valid without exception. See, we could have just said, okay, Maxwell's equations, that's another alternative. We could have said Maxwell's equations are only valid inside of an inertial reference frame and outside an inertial reference frame. We don't have them as being true. You got to add the speed of light differently. Maybe the speed of light has changed, but experiment shows that that's false as well. So what, got, was what Einstein did is he said, no, let's keep Maxwell's laws the same and let's keep Galilean relativity and let's abandon Newton's concept of absolute time and absolute space. So that's a big, big, big step. So let's see first what the implications of that are, and then we'll look at the experimental nature of it. So the implication of that, there are three big, three big implications that occur if you eliminate 
the, if you eliminate the, concept, the absolute uh, nature of time and space, but you still keep the physical laws of observation. So remember that time and space aren't observables. They're what they are. So what do we mean by an observable? Okay, so time, here's what the Einstein really said. He said that time is something you read off of a local clock. So there's this clock right here, right behind me. And that is the time in this room, right here, right now. I'm very close to the clock. I can measure my time with respect to that clock. Now, can I measure my time with respect to a clock in Singapore, or on the moon, or on Titan, or in Germany, or in Rio de Janeiro, or in San, Gu San Juan, uh, San, or in San Juan? Can I do that? Sure, but there's more tricks to it. The better way to define it, and in fact, asking that second question actually redefines what we mean. So, if time is simply the thing we read off of a local clock, all right, when we may say that statement, we are in, we're saying, what is the time in our inertial frame? That's all we're asking, in our local inertial frame. So. We can have a really big inertial frame so long as everything's moving uniformly, but maybe that's hard to do. So let's pretend that's hard to do, and in fact, it kind of is. But let's say that we can make a very small room, such as the room I'm standing, and you can make it move uniformly through space, which it seems to do as, it, as the Earth goes around the sun. So one of the implications of that, of time simply being something you measure locally, is that when you look at a moving clock, or a set of moving clocks. Maybe you have three clocks in a row moving by you. The, the movement of those clocks is out of sync. So synchronicity or simultaneity does not exist for moving objects. So I'm watching something move, they're out of sync. But if I was with those three moving clocks inside of that moving room, let's say I had this room filled with clocks and I'm setting them all to be the same. I look around the room, I look around the room and I, t and I change the clocks here and there all around the room such that they are the same. So there, there's a process by which you do that, right? You have to set them all. But eventually I can make them all be the same and it doesn't take too much because the distance across here isn't that big. So I can actually re easily measure their, their distance. So here's what we do. Now, as long as we have all those clocks the same in this room, now we take this room and speed it really fast. This is, I'm in New York City, so we move it very far upstate, really fast, as fast as we can go, maybe half the speed of light, really fast. As I'm zooming by people, and people are getting out of the way, they see that the clocks in the front are moving a little bit slower behind the clocks in the back of the room. So clocks in the front of the room are a little bit slower than the clocks in the back of the room. At least their, their time that they read is different. That's kind of weird. So to an outside observer, the clocks in this room are not in, are not in sync. All right, next, the next thing that is, is that all the moving clocks in this room, according to an outside observer, are running slowly, according to, uh, according to his clock outside. So inside this room, inside my local inertial reference frame, I have set them all, and they're all ticking along, tick, 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 tick. That's what I see. That is what I measure. I measure my clocks inside this room to be moving all with the normal uniform thing. I'm talking fast, but I'm talking like how many words per second, etc. But that's what it is. The time is just simply read locally, but I don't see any change because I'm in inertial reference frame. I go outside, I watch me, and then I take my buddies and we're going out, they watch me zoom by. What do they see? They see me moving slowly, they, I mean, inside of here, inside of here, the time apparently is moving slowly. So actions appear to be taking longer, and that's a bit weird. So moving clocks run slower. And the third thing is that moving objects are apparently foreshortened in the direction of their motion. That's a really weird one. So if something's moving this way, not only do, do what, but inside my inertial reference frame, again, inside here, I can lay down meter sticks either in the direction I'm moving or across the direction or across the direction, up and down, backwards and forwards, it doesn't matter how I measure things. I don't see the room being squished. The room is not being squished according to me 
because I am in the inertial reference frame. In a different inertial reference frame outside watching me, they see the length of the room because the room is going this direction. They see the length of the room getting squished in the direction of motion. So they see my clocks running slower. They see the room foreshortened inside of there. So these are crazy things. And this is all as a result of one important element of special relativity. Not only are all inertial reference frames the same, but the speed of light, no matter what, no matter who measures it, no matter how they measure it, is always the same number. That's important. The speed of light measured by everybody, no matter what, is the same, is constant. So. That's where we're getting this from. Now, notice that speed of light is just meters per second, right? Like 300,000 uh, kilometers per second or three, 300 million meters per second, right? Three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So, well, that's simply a conversion factor between meters and seconds, right? So they're conversions. So we're just saying, how many meters are there in a second? Which is an interesting statement in of itself. Because if the speed of light is simply a conversion factor, then we can say, well, how many feet are there in a mile? How many, how many hours are there in a day? How many seconds are there in a year? How many meters are there in a second? We just simply treat it as a conversion factor between space and time. And now you can muck around with it by allocating space and time slightly differently. And that's all special relativity does, is it says that you're basically moving through space-time, four-dimensional space-time, always at the speed of light, always. And if you're standing still, all you do, you move in your reference frame. If you're standing still in your reference frame, you simply see yourself moving through space-time only through time. So I'm moving in my inertial reference frame through space-time, specifically at the speed of light through time. I'm not moving left or right fast, but from an outside observer, when I'm moving by them, they see me allocate some of my time movement to through their space movement. That's kind of a weird way of saying, let's justify it though. So let's go back and look at each one of these three things in, in sequence. So first thing, uh, also we just gotta remember that this is a measurement thing, not a trick. It's not a ghostly thing. It's not a trick of the view. It's not like something where it's like, oh, if I look at it the right way, these clock measurements won't be like that, etc. It's not a trick. So next time, what we'll do is I'll look at the exact nature of exactly what we mean by these, uh, by these things and actually describe them in more detail. We'll see you next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Okay, last time we introduced the concept of special relativity, which said that the inertial reference frames are equal for everyone so long as you are in one. So if you're in an inertial reference frame, you can't tell one inertial reference frame from another by any means, except that they might be moving relative to each other. That's the only thing. Now, inertial reference frames can't be accelerating with respect to each other. They can't be decelerating. They can't be rotating. They're simply moving uniformly at a uniform speed or they're standing still. That's the essence of an inertial reference frame. And we found that there were some implications for that given that everyone measures the same speed for the speed of light. The speed of light is a constant no matter who measures it. That is the other axiom of special relativity. So they had impl this has implications. One of the implications is that moving clocks are out of sync with clocks in, in the direction uh, that are ahead in the reference frame that's being observed, uh, being out of sync with respect to clocks that are across the entire reference frame that you're watching go by. The next one is, if you're watching an inertial reference frame or measuring the clocks of an inertial reference frame as it's moving by, those clocks seem to be moving slower. And third, if you're watching an inertial reference frame, measuring what you see inside that frame as it moves by, you see that the entire reference frame appears to be shortened in the direction of motion. And this is all due to the constancy of the speed of light. No matter what the speed of light is, it is what it is, and therefore you, don't, you never measure it adding or subtracting onto any other speed. The movement of an inertial reference frame does not add to the speed of light, nor does something moving inside of an inertial reference frame add or subtract from the speed of light. The speed of light 
is always a constant no matter who observes it. That's a universally bizarre statement. So, and this what's funny thing is about this particular statement is that it's a measured, it's a measurable thing. So we can measure it. And in fact, special relativity, I'm just going to lead in really here because this is a bizarre concept, is that special relativity is so incredibly well studied and well measured that we no longer measure the speed of light. It is simply defined. The speed of light is defined as a conversion factor between distance and time. So we actually define the unit of distance based on the unit of time. And by using special, rel because special relativity is seen to be so completely true. So what are, we'll describe some of the experiments that show that in a second. So, so once again, special relativity is not a trick. You don't move, you don't change reference frames and then all of a sudden, oh, it's gone. And so these effects are gone. They're not tricks. They're not tricks of the eye. They're not ghosts. They're real effects and they're real effects of measurement. And so one of the important things is, is that we no longer have simultaneity. We no longer have absolute space. We no longer have absolute time. Time is simply the thing that you measure on a local clock. So that local clock is that thing that tells us time in our initial frame. All right, so what do we mean by sinking clocks? Let's, let's see what we mean by that. So let's look at those three things in general. Moving clocks are out of sync. Great. All right, so how can we define what we mean by, by clocks that are in sync? All right, so imagine in this room, I've set up a whole bunch of clocks. Some of them are hanging by the ceiling, some of them are on tables, some are on chairs, some are on the floor, some are on the walls, and they're everywhere. And I wanna make sure they're all in sync so that when they go off at noon and they do their alarms, they go off at exactly the same time, they give 12 chimes and then stop. So that's my goal. So how would I do that? All right, so I would start by making one of my clocks a reference clock, and I'd say, okay, this is my reference clock, and it's ticking. So then, first things first, I make sure that every one of the other clocks is ticking at the same speed. That's good, because maybe I wound them up too tight, or maybe they're defective or something, and I just get rid of the clocks that don't go at the same speed. So inside of my inertial reference frame, I have a whole bunch of clocks that tick at the same speed, at the same rate. So I hear this tick, tick, tick and make sure it's a nice big tick like a grandfather clock so they all make a ticking sound not digital things so that don't make any sounds although I could do that but you know digital clocks that beep are really irritating so we don't use those we're just going to use like these mechanical watches because they look cool so all right so we got mechanical tickings that occur and we can hear the ticks because maybe there's a hundred of them in the room so how do I make sure they're in sync well I go to a particular clock that might be this one on the far wall and I, I send, I have the, the clocks now have the ability to link with each other. And how do they link with each other? Well, they say, I lay down a series of meter sticks and they say, okay, Mr. Clock, these are smart clocks and they're mechanical, but they're smart. So I lay down a meter stick between them and say, okay, from this clock to that clock is exactly two meters. Great. So now, clock the clock, this, the master clock knows that when it sends a signal, it, the far clock, the far clock is exactly two meters away. And then that far clock is going to take that signal and immediately respond that it got the, that it got the signal. So we can, uh, we can know how long we do, well, maybe because they all run at the same rate, we know how long it takes the clocks to respond because they're all made by the same manufacturer or something like that. And we test that. So we know that they respond at the same rate. So we can take that into account. So the clock sends a signal, it processes the signal and sends the signal back. So from that round trip time, we can determine whether or not a clock is in sync or not. And so if it's out of sync, we send another pulse. And we do that to all of them everywhere in the room. And so the master clock then can determine whether or not every single clock in the room is exactly synced with it. Because as it sends a signal out, it knows maybe that one's five meters away. Maybe this one's a half a meter away. Maybe this one's right next to it. Maybe there's one's 20 meters away. It's a big room. So let's say they're all now in sync. So we've got a lattice of clocks on the walls, on the floors, on the tables, on the chairs, that all are in sync. Now, I take this box, this room, this inertial frame, and I move it. I get it moving. It's now moving at half the speed of light that way. What does a person outside see? All right. So a person outside is watching this zoom by. Here we go. All the things moving by. So as they move by, 
maybe the clock master clock still has to try to keep all of them in sync. So it's going to do that. It's going to try to keep all of them in sync. So what it'll do is it'll send out a signal and that signal then gets responded to. And the pulse of the signal from the master clock spreads out at the speed of light and gets intercepted by the clocks and then they respond. So inside of the clock, because we always have to stay in sync. So may, let's just reduce it down to three. So we got three clocks, one in the middle and two on each end. So in the reference frame that's moving, it's scooting along. We don't know that it's moving because we're at rest inside of an inertial reference frame. So the clocks then just ping back and forth and they're just pinging back and forth nicely like this. Ping, ping, ack, ping, ack, ping, ack. That's what they're doing. So, but what does somebody see that the, the clocks are moving by? Well, since the speed of light is constant, Remember, this is like a light pulse. It's going out at the speed of light and coming back at the speed of light. So what does somebody see that's going by? Well, the clocks leave the signal behind a little bit or catch up to the signal. So if the clocks are here and then they're here, the signal simply spreads out from the place it was it started. So the first clock to encounter the signal is the one trailing. So it sends its response back. And the other set clock that's going this way, and it sets its time as soon as it gets the signal. It doesn't wait to send the clock signal back. But then the second one, which is in the lead, has to wait a little bit because it's rushing away from the, from the signal, according to someone outside. So therefore, the clocks in the lead are a little bit behind the clocks that are trailing because the clocks that are trailing catch up to the signal and the clocks that are leading are rushing away from the signal. And the signal starts from here and expands outward. Not from, a, the, the signal source doesn't rush with it. The signal source, source, according to an outside observer, starts there and rushes outward. So therefore, the clocks, according to an observer watching from the outside, seem to be out of sync. That's interesting. That's our first thing. And we can think about it even a rocket ship. So, I'll, so you can have three rocket ships in a row and they ping back and forth. So the three rocket ships then are their clocks out of sync. They're not even physically associated with each other. They just simply are flying in formation at exactly the same distance so that the, spin, the ping back and forth occurs. The three clocks and the three moving spaceships they will appear to be out of sync as they zoom by, if they're zooming by at very fast speeds. All right. So the next one is that moving clocks themselves appear to be moving slower. All right, well not even appear, they do move slower according to someone watching them. So I'm watching a moving clock. I, again, I make, an I make my, my room a place where clocks are working. But now I'm gonna make a really special clock. I'm gonna make my inertial frame extremely large. Um, Let's make it just gargantuanly big. It's gonna, let's make it almost, let's make it out to the moon. Moon is about 200,000 miles away, roughly a little bit bigger than 186,000 miles, and you'll see why I'm gonna use that in a second. In a second. Um, but let's say we've got a really big room, and this really tall room, I don't care about it as being big, I care about it being tall. And so inside of this tall inertial reference frame that's moving by at a very fast rate, all I have is something that creates a signal, it makes a flash at the bottom of the clock, and that flash moves straight up the column and reflects off a mirror and comes all the way back down. And I'll call that a light clock. So it will only flash again when it gets the signal for the previous flash. So it goes flash, bounce, flash, flash, bounce, flash, flash, bounce, flash. And really we only care about one flash, but that's okay. Because the speed, remember the flash of light that's inside the clock moves at the speed of light, according to everyone, not just me, but to everyone. The speed of light of the flash, no matter who measures it, always measure goes at the speed of light. Great. So now we've got this tube that's 186,000 miles long that goes that has a mirror at the top and a big flashy bulb at the bottom and the light stays inside of the tube. It doesn't go outside the tube, it can't leave the tube, it's inside the tube. So, what, and we know that it hits the top of the tube because that thing like turns a red light green or something silly. And it turns at the bottom, it turns a red light green as soon as it signals. So we can know when the flash hits the bottom and hits the top. Okay, so, what does so I see that it ticks once per se, every other second? Remember, it's 186,000 miles long, so it flashes, ticks, and goes there. So it is a two-second round trip. 
I could cut that in half, but I like the idea of going to the moon and back in a second and a half, so in two seconds. So we have a tube. It goes up and down inside of two seconds. Let's cut it in half so it's one second long, one light second long. Well, it's a light second long, light second high uh, tube. So how fast is it now moving? Let's take the tube and now with the entire room and it's moving to the left at, say, half the speed of light. All right, so what does an outside observer see? First, the light pulse never leaves the tube. It can't leave the tube. It doesn't leave the tube. It stays inside the tube. So we're all in the tubes together. It's not going down the tubes. It's going up the tube. All right, so the light pulse stays in the tube. So as it moves, it appears from our perspective, watching the tube go by. So inside, we just watch the thing go up and down and up and down. But outside, we see it go at an angle. We see the light pulse go at an angle. Because as the tube moves, the light pulse stays inside the tube. Interesting. So let's say it's going half the speed of light. Well, now you've got an interesting triangle don't you? See, the tube height is one side of the triangle, and then how far it goes in a certain period of time is another side of the triangle, meaning half the speed of light times the time you're looking at it. Maybe two seconds. Maybe you're only watching this thing for, for, for one second. Let's keep it really simple. For one second. So you've got the flash of light moving up the tube according to us. We don't see it actually make it to the top of the tube. Hmm. Why not? Because, it, because it's one light second long and the flash only goes so far. It goes one light second. It does travel at the speed of light, but the clock appears to be running slower because it doesn't make it to the top. Some of the speed is being, uh, some of the speed, the clock speed is being allocated to move through time. All right, so we can take the length that it's going, the speed with which it's going, times the time we're watching it for. Doesn't matter how long we're watching it for. But we know inside the tube they have their clock, and they see the, the, the light pulse going up and down at the speed of light times the time that they're watching it. So how does this time convert into the time that we see from the outside? Well, it's just simply the Pythagorean theorem. So you got the speed of light times the time that we see it to go, uh, which is the which is the hypotenuse of the triangle, and then we have the speed of, the speed with which the tube is going across our line of sight or towards us or away from us, um, and that's going so far and so and so fast. So we have that speed times that time, which is a distance squared, and then this distance, which is the inside the clock that the observer that the person riding with the clock sees. So that speed is the speed of light uh, speed of light times their clock time squared. So that's, a, that's Pythagorean theorem, and we find that if we do the algebra, that the actual time difference that we find is that the clock speed, the clock time that we measure outside is longer than the time, is, is longer than their time inside. So the time, there is a difference between the two times, and we on the outside see the clock moving by going slower. Now it's relative. So if you were in the clock tube with the clock tube looking out, you would measure the exact same thing if they had a bunch of clocks that they were that you were rushing by. That's really fascinating. So this is not an, this is not some trick. Remember, it's relativity, so you see things both ways equally. So if you are stable and steady and everything's rushing by you, you see them moving slowly. Uh, in their clocks moving slowly. And everything, every aspect, every clock, biological processes, movements, you drop something, it seems to drop slower. You throw something, it appears to, it is measured by you outside to be moving slower. Heartbeat rates are slower. Anything that could possibly be used as a clock is moving slower. Therefore, time rushes slower by as when you look at an inertial reference frame that is moving by you. Inside that inertial reference frame, it's moving slower. That's a very counterintuitive thing, but it's all a result of the constancy of the speed of light. Right. And our third thing is that the uh, length of the room that's rushing by is shorter. So let's go back to our original idea that we got a room filled with clocks, and they've got a room filled with clocks, and it's rushing by us. And so I'm now, I've set everything up, I jump outside, I watch the room rushing by. 
I see that actually the room must move, must compress. In fact, it does compress as it moves by. The, the room is shorter in the direction of motion. Well, why is that? I mean, that's kind of weird. And that's because everyone has to agree on measurements. Everyone has to be able to predict each other's measurements. Because if I'm watching that move, it's the same as if they're in there watching me move. So the, speed, the relative speed is the same no matter who's watching that. So we've got a stationary thing. That's me thinking I'm stationary and the clock is in the room with the clocks is moving by. Or if you're in the room of clocks and you're looking outside and watching somebody else and you would think they are moving by. It's just in a negative direction, you know? So it's the speed is the same, but it's in a different direction. So the effect must be the same. So you measure the distance, measure a speed is measured simply by some length divided by some time. And so no matter how you measure it, it's always some length divided by some time. And that speed is the same for both because it's a relative speed. So the person's measuring rulers, let's say, oh, I got a ruler, I'm gonna measure how big that looks. Uh, when I'm looking at the window. So the distance, we already know that the clock times are different. So in order for the speeds to be the same, then the distances must be different. And so therefore the short, the distance must be different because the speed must be same. It's just a change in distance divided by a change in time. But we already know the diff, the time is different and the speed is the same. So therefore, for the, for the other observer, we must see that the length of the, the clock, the distance must be shortened by the exact same rate that the time is, is lengthened. So this is a really interesting uh, set, of, set of parameters. So everybody has to, it has to be mutually exclusive. You can't gain time by going from one place to another. You can't lose time by going from one place to another. The relative speeds are constant. That's the first postulate of special relativity is that inertial frames are equal. And that I see, I'm an inertial frame, you're an inertial frame. So the speed with which they're going relative to each other says it's just a length divided by a distance, a length divided by a time, and a length divided by a time. And everybody measures that. We already know the clock times are different, so therefore the lengths have to be different in order for the speed to be the same. That is, the set, that is because of the central axiom of the first axiom of special relativity. We're keeping Galilean relativity that you can't tell that you're moving. You're in an inertial reference frame. So, yeah, this is kind of weird, ain't it? And so it's a necessity of it that if the speed of light is a constant, no matter who's observing it, time is slower. The length that you measure for a moving reference frame is shorter. That's foreshortened in the direction of motion. The clocks are out of sync. So this is a big bunch of statements. Is it true? All right, is it really, really, really true? Well, okay, Rossi and Hall in 1941, uh, we're, doing dis we're doing work on cosmic rays. And so there are particular kind of cosmic rays, which are high energy protons or uh, high energy nuclei that hit the Earth's upper atmosphere. And when they hit the Earth's upper atmosphere, they basically uh, hit other atoms that are in the Earth's atmosphere. And that creates, because it's a very energetic collision, it creates um, other particles, other subatomic particles. It can create electrons, it can create neutrinos, but specifically one of the particles that's created are called muons. And muons are kind of like electrons, except they're a lot more massive. And because they're more massive, they're unstable and they fall apart and break, up, break down. So muons, therefore, have a very short half-life. We don't see a lot of muons around here. Nobody gives you a, you can't go to the bodega and get a muon sandwich. So muons don't live very long. In free space, they live about a, a one and a half microseconds. So that's kind of a very short lifespan before they break apart and decay into other products. So, What's, but then they have a specific mass and they have a specific charge. So you can measure that if you can catch them. You can say, oh, I'm getting this amount of charge. Oh, I'm getting this stuff. I'm getting hit by this kind of mass. So we can measure that, et cetera, et cetera. So you can measure how many muons ex uh, arrive at your detector. So let's say you're down on the ground at sea level and you have a little muon detector. And you look and you say, wow, I'm getting, I'm getting thousands of muon hits per second, maybe a few hundred hits, whatever it is, a few hundred hits of muons per second. Here's the thing. Muons live only a microsecond, right? So if time dilation did not occur from us watching the muon travel to us, because where do they get formed? 
they hit the upper atmosphere of the Earth, which is about 20 kilometers up or 12 miles up. They, let's just call it 10 kilometers or so, right? So let's say it's about 20 kilometers or 10 kilometers, somewhere very high up. It so happens that the weight of decay is exponential. So you'll, half of them will disappear in a half-life. So the half-life of a muon is about a microsecond and a half. So it takes about 30, th there's about, so how far does it travel inside of that time? It travels about maybe 500 meters. Great, 500 meters, right? How much is 500, maybe 400 or 500 meters compared to 10 or 20 kilometers? That's a lot. So you could say, well, if we say these are 20 kilometers, call it 500 meters, it's 1, 20, 40. So there would be, it would be reduced, there's 40 of those lengths between when it's first created and how far it would go. So we'd say half of them would be go away after one length, right? So you might make a whole bunch of them at the top. One length later, four or 500 meters later, you expect to have half of them remaining. 500 meters after that, you have half of those remaining. And 500 meters after that, you have half of those remaining. And you do that 40 times, because remember, it's 20 kilometers, it's a half, it's a half each time. So you have two to the 40th less at the bottom. So let's say you detect a thousand. Let's say you detect a thousand of them. To get a thousand at the bottom, you would need to create two to the 40th times a thousand to get there. So that's a huge, huge, well, it's actually more than that. It's much larger than that. For every one that you get, it had to have been the, ten, uh, wow. So to get one, that means you, you left behind ten, two to the thir 40th, which is a huge number to leave behind. So because we actually get hundreds and thousands at sea level, therefore the time must be delayed. Why? Because their clocks move slower because when they're created, it's such an energetic reaction that it takes a very short period of time, about a microsecond, to get from the top of the Earth's atmosphere to the bottom. That's what we see them to be. We see their clocks foreshortened. So therefore, instead of getting the expected zero, number of muons because they would they should disappear in the upper atmosphere they should just simply go away but we get them at sea level to the 40th is a big quench it quenches a lot so we get them so therefore their clocks are running slower all right so that's kind of a weird thought let's say we're riding let's use this special relativistic concept and say let's say we're riding along with the muons and why i said rossi and hall is they actually devised this idea and measured it so that's pretty cool. And then you say, let's, uh, let's, let's now devise the idea that what does it feel like to ride along with a muon? Well, if you're riding along in a muon, you don't have an extended bunch of clocks and you can't see the clocks. But what you can see is that you arrive at the Earth. All right. So you see, instead of seeing 400, but you only go 400 meters or 500 meters. Remember that I remember in your clock time frame, you live a microsecond and a half. And so you can only go that 100, 500 meters before you fall apart. That's your life. So therefore, the atmosphere appears to be compressed in the direction of motion. So the Earth itself appears to rise up at you faster because the distance between where you were born and where you hit the Earth is shorter. So that's how it works out. So from our perspective, looking at the muon, its clock, its internal clock, how long it lives is longer, is apparently longer. And from the muon's perspective, it has its own internal clock. It says, I'm only going to live a microsecond before I pop. But yet that microsecond, because it's moving so fast, or more specifically, the Earth appears to be rushing towards it. In fact, the Earth is, remember it's a muon, it says, I'm at rest in my reference frame. So the Earth is rushing towards it. That's relativity. That's the first postulate of special relativity. The Earth is rushing towards it. So since the Earth is rushing towards the muon, it seems to be rushing so fast that the distance between it when it was born and where it hits the Earth is only about 500 meters. So that's an amazing, amazing set of things. There are numerous other experiments that show the, uh, the, these results from special relativity. Special relativity is so well established that it is no longer considered, it's considered completely settled science. It is used as part of the, de the definition of the meter. We no longer measure the speed of light. All those experiments that we heard about, about the measurement, the speed of light, they're irrelevant now because special relativity says that it's simply a conversion factor between length 
and time. That's all it is, which is really something. So special relativity is extremely well established, and it's in a basis for most of many of our many of our scientific uses. And in fact, we've replaced no longer worry about the length of something. We worry about only the measurement of time, because we convert it to length by defining the speed of light. The speed of light is a definition. All right. So next time we'll take it a bit further and see how this merges in with gravity. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we went through special relativity and learned how space-time is changed by motion of relative motion of two inertial frames. So an inertial frame, again, is a place where all clocks and all measuring sticks are all in a line and all lined up with respect to each other, and uh, they're moving uniformly through space. And so they can either be still or moving uniformly. They're not accelerating or decelerating. Well, that's special relativity. But let's actually take another step because we've actually talked extensively in the past about gravity. So gravity then is a different thing because, well, when you drop something, it accelerates. It doesn't stay the same speed. You should try this at home. You should actually check it this way. When you drop something, how fast does it hit the ground? Does it hit it faster when it gets to the ground, or does it hit slower? A way to do it is to drop something from a very short height, see how long it takes. You can then drop something from a larger height. Maybe it's something that's easy to drop, like a, like a very small, like a, like, a, like a lead ball or something that doesn't get much wind resistance. You'll find that as it gets to the bottom, it is accelerated and is actually going faster. And that is a result of the acceleration due to gravity. So gravity accelerates you downward. And the rate of acceleration at the Earth's surface is 9.8 meters per second squared. So every me it goes for every second it falls, it goes 9.8 meters per second faster. So call it 10. The first second it drops 10 meters per second. The second second is 20. The third second is 30, and so on and so on. So when you fall in a gravitational field, you accelerate. Well, what else did we find a long time ago that causes acceleration? We can go back to Newton's laws, Newton's three laws, and one of the, his definition of the force, of the force, not like force like Star Wars, but force. A force is something that accelerates a mass. And we also learned about from Newton that the force due to gravity is, the, is proportional to the two masses that are gravitating with respect to each other, divided by their distance apart between them squared. So here's the interesting thing, is that Newtonian physics says that for any force, it doesn't matter what it is, if you apply a force to a mass, it accelerates. And the resistance to that acceleration is what we call its inertial mass. So we can think of inertia as the quality of a thing not to change its direction or its speed um, or where it's, or how fast it's going, what its location, or, or how fast it's rotating, or, how fa or what direction it's going. So mass then is a measure of how resistant something is to accelerating. So if you know the force you're pushing with something, and you see what the acceleration is due to that on that mass, then you can determine the mass by seeing it's, it's how fast it accelerates. Less massive things accelerate more quickly than more massive things, etc. But here's the funny thing, is that Newton also described the force due to gravity. And that's a very strange thing because the force due to gravity also has the mass and has the two masses, to one versus the other. But let's look at them carefully for a bit. Um, the first mass is what we call the inertial mass, and so you can take a mass, you can put it on a table, and push it. Maybe with like a rocket or something, or maybe a string pulling it, or something like that. And if you have a string pulling it at a constant force, you have to keep accelerating as you move, but you can actually pull on something with a string, and that string will then, or however you pull it, that force will then drag, accelerate the mass. Now that's across a table, so it doesn't rise or lower. The mass is simply the resistance to motion. Now wait a second, we take that same mass and we hold it above our head and drop it, it will accelerate also. And if we measure the force due to gravity on this thing, we would measure that it's the same mass. Now this is a strange thing because they seem to be coincidentally the same mass. There are two different ways of measuring mass. One, resistance to motion across a gravitational field, 
Meaning gravity has nothing to do with if it doesn't go up or down. Or gravity is always up and down. It's not side to side. You never hear of a gravitational force to the right-hand side of the room. You never hear about that. You only hear about falling due to gravity. You fall down. You go up against gravity. So gravity is not side to side. So how is it that the mass due to an, excel an inertial mass can be the same as a gravitational mass? All right. So... Gra Einstein came along in 1907 after com accomplishing special relativity and he said he had a couple of problems with Newtonian mechanics and the first one is that where is, well if you look at, well specifically the gravitational equa the force equation, he said how does time figure into this? He already knows that from, this, from, spe from special relativity that nothing goes faster than the speed of light. It takes an infinite amount of energy in order to go faster than the speed of light, to accelerate something faster than the speed of light, or even up to the speed of light. So how is it possible that the gravitational force is communicated instantaneously? It doesn't matter how it's, how it's done, it's done instantly. So Einstein said, wait a second, you change the Earth's mass and it affects something on Pluto immediately. Well, he didn't know about Pluto at that point. Well, he, yes, it would have been about 20 years later. So he knew about, ne he knew about uh, Neptune. Neptune's very far away and it's far enough away it would take light hours to get to Neptune. But according to Newton, you shift something in Earth, maybe, to, maybe move Earth up or down fast. Then Neptune, 40 astronomical units away, would feel that change instantaneously. That's faster than the speed of light. And so how can gravity's influence go faster than the speed of light? That was, that was uh, Einstein's first one. And the second one was, is that he said, as I described before, how can the inertial mass be the uh, same as the gravitational mass. He said, well, the inertial mass is kind of like a resistance to acceleration, but the gravitational mass acts like a charge. Think of a charge as like the charge that you put on an electric charge. And so if you have an electric charge, this electric charge will, will determine the electric force between them. So you can say that gravity can be looked at as the charge of mass of two objects. How much force they pull is dependent upon the mass charge. Now, if we never had a concept of Newtonian inertial mass, or maybe we developed gravitational mass at first, we might have thought of terms of mass as a charge, as opposed to anything else. We said, oh, mass is just the charge of an object that does that resists acceleration. So it's kind of an odd way of talking about it. But the important thing is, is that we cannot actually, uh, it's, it's a starting point where the inertial mass is, is not necessarily the same thing as the gravitational mass. There's no instantaneous reason to say they are the same. But Newton uh, didn't uh, posited that they were. He just said, well, Newton didn't know why gravity worked. He said, I have no idea why it worked. I don't frame any hypothesis about how gravity worked. I just know that these equations do work. And so they were extremely successful. Newton's theory of gravity was an extremely successful um, way of talk discussing things. And nobody really saw a problem because the gravitational worked just fine. Let's see what some of the successes. It explained Kepler's laws. It explained the motions of the planets. It explained the Earth's precession as it, wrote, as it, as it uh, rotates on its axis, how the Earth precesses. It explained the tides on the surface of the Earth due to the differential gravitational pull by the Moon and the Sun. It predicted the orbit of Neptune, the existence of Neptune, which was then later found. It also, even most dramatically, predicted the return of Halley's Comet to the day. So Newton's laws of gravity and motion are extremely successful, and they do seem to describe our world as we know it. So, but there's a couple of odd problems with Newton's laws, and they were waiting on the horizon for things to occur. One of them is this action at a distance idea that needs to be answered in some way. And then the strangeness of the equation of an inertial mass versus gravitational charge mass. But there was another observational issue. Mercury, in its orbit around the sun, has, uh, it, 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 its orbit doesn't quite close. It's got an elliptical orbit, but when it gets back to the perihelion, it actually is farther along. So the, the orbit itself precesses. It makes like a flower shape as it goes around and around, rather than an even ellipse. So Newtonian, uh, uh, Newtonian gravitational theory, as well as Newtonian mechanics, 
says, oh yes, if we add up all the effects of all the other planets and the distance from the sun, and the, the effect of the distance of the gravity from the sun as it goes, uh, from, uh, and if we check all the possible influences, yes, we can account for the 531 arc seconds per century of precession of Mer Mercury's orbit around the sun. So the position of the near point to the sun changes by 531 arc seconds which is an angular measurement, per century. Now, here's the problem. This Newtonian mechanics doesn't predict the actual value. The actual value is 574 arc seconds. So there's 43 arc seconds, almost an arc minute, almost a portion of it, a, a significant portion of a degree that is lost. It's like one, almost 1 60th of a degree, maybe almost like 1% of a degree that is lost, that Newtonian mechanics cannot predict. And so people were thinking, wow, we need to modify Newtonian mechanics in order to fix, the Newton to fix Mercury's orbit. And so there were some people going off and thinking in those terms. But Einstein came along and said, wait, it's an acceleration. Mass gets accelerated. So if mass is accelerating, we're starting to think about it because when you drop something in a gravitational field, it accelerates. So there is something about dropping things in gravitational fields that gets them accelerating that might be linked. So Einstein then said, now wait a second. I see that Newton says that the, I, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are different things, but he says that they could be the same or they're coincidentally the same. They don't have to be the same, but by sheer coincidence, and these were Newton's own thinking, is that by sheer coincidence, they seem to be the same. That was the consensus. So Einstein, in 1907, to start down the road of general relativity, said the following. He, po he said it as a postulate. He said, they are the same. The inertial mass is the same thing as the, as the gravitational mass. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but just think about how you can accelerate things. You can accelerate things not using gravity. And sometimes when you have gravity, and you can balance a force uh, due to gravity by something that is not due to gravity. And so however you measure their forces, they're the same. So if you had to, and then if you change the force on it, you would actually change how you applied one force, you could actually measure a difference. So the fact of the matter is, is that there was no a priori reason for them to be the same. But Einstein said, nope, let's actually make them the same. And this provided the basis for all of general relativity because this is the concept that we call the principle of equivalence. And the principle of equivalence says that even further, it goes and says that there's no difference between a freely falling frame of reference and one that's far from a gravitational field. So they, you just fall the same way. And more succinctly, the laws of physics are the same for any freely falling observer. So you take a frame and you let it fall. Notice that this is different than spatial relativity. You take any frame and let it fall. Any freely falling observer sees the same laws of physics. Now, let's, put, let's take it this way. Um, that's different than special relativity. Special relativity says any uniformly moving um, frame of reference cannot be distinguished from any other uniformly. The laws of physics are the same for any uniformly, me uh, uniformly moving uh, reference frame. So one frame has one thing, one, another frame has another thing. They're both moving uniformly with respect to each other, not accelerating, not de decelerating, not rotating. That's why I said that in the last lecture. So in that sense, they're different. So a freely falling accelerates. You can have something freely fall and accelerate. Well, how do we mean? Well, look at any image from the International Space Station. What are they doing? They're orbiting the Earth. They're falling. They're falling towards the Earth, but their lateral motion gets them so that they don't hit the ground. So as the International Space Station falls towards the ground, it's moving to the left fast enough that the Earth has, it, it's actually, the Earth has curved away out from underneath it. And this, is, uh, this was actually part of Newtonian dynamics, is that Newtonian dynamics said, hey, if you shoot something fast enough, the time it takes to fall, if the Earth's curvature has gone off from under it, then the Earth, it'll, rotate, it'll go all the way around. And this idea has been part of Newtonian mechanics for a very long time. In fact, Newton himself predicted this. It's called an orbit. 
And so, geo, so another way to think about it is like, wait, 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 wait. Remember that the bullet or the cannonball that's fired from the top of the mountain that's going to go all the way around the Earth, it is falling towards the ground. It just has a lateral velocity that make, goes so fast that by the time it falls to the ground below it, the Earth's curvature has gone away out from underneath it. So when we say that the laws of physics are the same for any freely falling observer, that also applies to somebody in orbit. So if we look at people on board the International Space Station, they're floating, they seem to move, they appear to be weightless. How is that different than if we took the International Space Station and put it way out into deep space, just halfway to the next star, so that there is no gravitational influence? What would they do? They would float. Why would they float? Well, there's nothing to hold them to the ground, no artificial gravity. This ain't Star Trek or Star Wars where people walk around inside of a spaceship. There's no gravity in space. Well, there is gravity in space, but not far from stars. There's no thing pulling you down. So, what, so every space science fiction show that has spaceships, they always justify it by saying gravity plating or something like that because otherwise, you know, you gotta always float your actors around. So in reality, if you were to take a spaceship and send it out halfway to the next star, everyone would float around. There would be nothing holding them, quote, down. There would be no such thing as down or up. You could design the spacecraft so that everything is on every side. And in fact, that's what they did with the Apollo spacecraft, is that switches and buttons were everywhere because, well, they would be floating. So if you go to the moon, you feel weightless, even though you're always falling. So there's no difference between weightlessness, I mean, the feeling of weightlessness, and freely falling towards something, which is a statement of general relativity, the principle of equivalence. All right, since there's no difference, you couldn't tell the difference between whether or not you're inside a moving spaceship or not. So I'm standing here inside of this room and I feel my weight on the ground. Good. Now, imagine just for a second that somebody comes along, maybe, uh, maybe the master from Doctor Who who has incredible powers and all of a sudden, they attach a whole bunch of rockets around the building that I'm standing in. And they attach all these rockets to the side of the building and magically remove the earth from underneath me and turn on the rockets exactly at the same time so the thrust is directed upwards. I couldn't tell the difference. Maybe there's a jolt. Let's assume that they're incredibly powerful and there's no jolt. There'd be no way for me to tell the difference between my being pushed down to the floor as a result of a gravitational pull or being pushed down to the floor because there's a rocket pushing me upwards. So if I took this room, attached rocket engines to it, sent it out into deep space, and put rockets towards it and accelerated it out to the left, I would feel a gravitational force to the left-hand side of the room, or one side of the room. Why? Because that's the direction the, the rockets are accelerating me this way. So I feel a gravitational push that way. And I couldn't tell the difference between a gravitational push and an acceleration. So that's an essence of it. There is no difference between an acceleration due to gravity and an acceleration due to any force. And there's no way to tell the difference whether you're falling in a gravitational field or you're completely out in empty space and you just simply have nothing around you. Notice freely falling. There's nothing holding you up. You're falling in a uniform gravitational field. There's no difference between them. That's the equivalence principle. And so what this means is that special relativity can then be uh, extended. And utilizing this idea, special relativity, which only discusses space and time, not really mass, it just describes, it does describe energy, it describes mass in its own way, but it only says if you're uniformly moving, of a uniformly moving reference frame, it does not add the effect of mass on the uh, surrounding space-time. And so when we think, well, wait a second, why do you fall towards the Earth when you're way up in space? Why do you fall? Because mass causes this gravitational acceleration. And so now we can start to bend the idea and say, well, wait a second. General relativity then says we add the effect of mass on space-time. Special relativity says there's no effect of mass on space-time. So what happens if we add the effect of, space -time, of mass on space-time? And that's what we'll get to next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today I'm going to finish off general relativity. So 
Last time we discussed the nature of the principle of equivalence and how the inertial mass equals the gravitational mass, and that became the starting point for Einstein's idea about general relativity, where he then posited that all freely falling frames see the same laws of physics. So if you're in a uniform gravitational field and falling, you feel the same laws of physics. Everything about the laws of physics is the same as if you were way out in space, seeing uh, just floating in space far away from any kind of gravitational source. So what this means was is that we're going to have to change what we mean by how we, by our relative terms, how we observe that distant person doing things in that distant frame. Not how you do things inside your own frame, because I could be in a freely falling frame in this room. I could be accelerating in this room upwards in a spaceship and going out away from, the, far from any star, far from any planet, just in a room that has rockets associated with it. And I would still have all of this laws of physics being absolutely identical. Okay, so what we have to look at then is that mass then, it says, what does mass do? Mass causes other mass to accelerate it when there's other mass near it. That's what we call gravity. But special relativity says that distances and times are measured only between uniform frames. And there are, uh, but distances and times are intimately linked. But uh, uh, through, uh, when special relativity is talking about, we're talking about uniform motion. So one frame moves uniformly next across to another. They're not turning around each other. They're not accelerating or decelerating past each other. They're uniformly moving. So general relativity then says, let's have non-uniform motion because a freely falling frame accelerates as it falls. So the, we can say that the geometry of space-time in special relativity is, quote, flat, and the geometry of general relativity is, quote, curved. So curved space-time, flat space-time, let's see what we mean by that and see some of its results. All right, so Newton found as a, a, Newton's ideas lead to the idea of the least action principle. And the least action principle, according to Newton, because of a universal clock across all of space and time, so across all of space, is that there's one clock. So Newton's least action principle said that any two objects between any two points, when an object moves from here to here, it does so in the least amount of time, if it's freely falling. And if it's under, a, no, it, well, it doesn't matter what it's doing. It always does so in the least amount of time. So in space-time, when a relative, Einstein noted that the only way you're gonna, you have to change the nature of the least action principle to say that objects move along the shortest paths between two points in space-time. Not between, not that minimizes time, but minimizes the length of the path in space-time. Notice how Newton is just length, they minimize the length of time. But you can take any path you want, but the forces that are acting independently or dependently will force that thing to move along in the shortest path in time. But, the, but, space, but when you look at space-time, you then have to say how space and time intermingle and objects move according to the shortest path in space-time. Space and time as a unit. So, in order, because now we're talking about space-time, we inherently drag in the concept of geometry because we use the word space. So space is a measurement, uh, it, space is measurement of left, right, backwards, forwards, up and down. So geometry is always that measurement. So now we're taking, we're actually, another way we can think about it is that geometry then, how do we extend geometry so we include the concept of time? And that's the concept of space-time. So Newton, of course, developed, he went through this idea of a universal time. But Einstein got rid of that and said that there is a space-time as, as linked and they're intertwined with, each, with respect to each other. All right, so then let's see what we mean by the shortest path. So the shortest path in a, in a flat space-time is kind of obvious. Well, let's say you have some object that's got a pointy direction thing. You say, well, let's make a, uh, an object that goes around in, a, in a, like a box or something. So let's make a closed path. I take my pencil and I move left, right, backwards, forwards. But I'm always keeping the pencil pointed in the same direction. In a flat space-time, on any flat surface, I could do this on the surface of a table, the, there, as long as I take the arrow or the, or the pencil and I simply transfer it little by little such that each time I move, 
from here to say here, I make sure that the pencil is pointed in the same direction as when I started here, and I move the pencil to here, but I keep it pointed in the same direction. So we're going to work with that as an idea. So let's keep the idea that we're going to move this, spent, this pencil by keeping it going in the same direction. All right, so a curved path might be like, you know, whatever it is, but a curved path through space-time is very similar to a curved path on a spatial object. So now I'm going to use my globe, because I came to the lab for that reason, and I'm going to say, what happens if I'm going to put this pencil on the surface of the globe, let's say here, and now I'm going to do what I did before, I'm going to move it across, and I want to end up back over here. And what happens when I do that? So first of all, I move it little bits at a time north so that it's always pointing in the same direction, right? I'm staying on a longitude line. I move all the way to the North Pole. And then I stay, and I've, now I move directly south. And I keep the pencil pointed by, you know, this is a very large, small globe. So, but if I was on the surface of the globe, I could walk it so that it always seems to be pointing south. But notice what's happening is that the direction of the, of the arrow, the, the vector, the pencil, is changing. And so then now when I parallel transport it, ooh, nice big word, all the way back to the original location, you'll see that the pencil is rotated. So I started here, moved up, moved down, moved across. And every step of the way that I did on the surface of the Earth, let's say I really did this, really marched it all the way from the equator, all the way to the North Pole, all the way back down to the equator, all the way across, I will have rotated it 90 degrees. I mean, I could just go up, move it straight down, and then move it across. And I've parallel transported it. So parallel transport is a funny thing. It means that no matter what, I'm going to take this thing. It's not just a location. It's a direction associated with that location. And so I'm going to try to move this little arrow around the globe as I go. So as I move it around the globe, if I'm, in North, if I'm in Canada and I keep walking it, I mean, I'll just walk like this. I'll say, oh, okay, I'm going to walk my pencil like this all the way down to the equator. And as I walk it, I'm always going to keep it pointing the same direction. But no matter what I do, I'm walking on a curved surface. So the curved surface itself changes the orientation. So that when I finally get back, and see so when I get to the equator, so I'm standing at the equator, and I want to make sure that the pencil stays pointed in this direction. But I know I've got to go west. So it's like, okay, the pencil stay direction that way. So then I move left because I keep the pencil pointed. See what I did? So I start here, I move up, I move over, and I move down, and I move back. One, two, and I move, actually move, move up, down, over. So as I do those motions, I always keep in touch with the, the direction of the pencil. So if I move up, down, over, so I've rotated it again. So what happens is, is that we can think of curvature in space-time as the failure for walking around a path to come back to the same orientation that you were when you come back to the place you started from. So if you take a closed path in a curved space and try to stay focused in the same direction, try to stay, always go in like this direction and always keep something pointed in that direction as you walk inside that and make a curved path, a closed path in that space, you'll rotate a little bit. And so that's how we actually measure curvature in space. If you wanted to measure, say, the curvature of anything in space and time, you then say, OK, I'm going to parallel transport this thing here. And then when I get there, I parallel transport it across. And I parallel transport it back. But notice in a flat space, it stays flat. So general relativity in a, in a freely falling frame Inside the freely falling frame itself, you see, you don't see any rotations, right? Because all laws of physics are the same inside a freely falling frame. But outside the frame looking, you see that the, that the person's accelerating, which means there's changes. So if I watch somebody freely falling in a gravitational field, I would see the effect of these rotations inside of there. There would be fictitious forces that I would see as I watch the person fall. But inside the frame, I'm not going to see any difference. I'm going to move my pencil around in this box, and I won't see anything because I'm freely falling with the frame. Outside, I'll see something different, relativity. All right, so parallel transport defines curvature 
And that's the thing that we use to, def to when, par when you cannot parallel transport it back to the original orientation, when you make a closed path, then you have curvature in space and time. Now, the funny thing is, is that even though it fails to come back to the same orientation, remember that's the straightest possible path in terms of space time. When you make that, cor that change, Einstein's least action principle says that that's the path you gotta take. And so, since it's the shortest possible path, that curvature plays a part and to changes orientations. So, what does this mean? It means that if you were to ask Newton about this, Newton would say, oh hey, that's not a big problem. Mass deflects the object from its, from its direction that it's going uh, because of the force due to gravity. And so there's an acceleration, and so since there's a force due to gravity, you change the orientation that it's going, and therefore it follows a curved path due to the force due to gravity. But here's what Einstein said. Einstein said, well wait, in a curved space, you don't have any forces. You're simply following the shortest possible path through that space-time. And if you're following the shortest possible path through that space-time, there is no force. That's what we mean by the equivalency of falling frames. The equivalency of falling frames means it doesn't matter if you're falling in a gravitational field or out in the middle of space. It doesn't matter at all. You're always following the shortest possible path through space. So, Mass then tells, we can, we can then say that it's not really a curved path. There are no forces. Einstein abolished the idea of the gravitational force. There is no force. You're simply following the lay of space-time, the lay of the land. It's a, very, it's a different way of thinking about it. You must accelerate in your speed as you fall in a gravitational field because space and time is curved in the direction that you're falling. I feel the weight on my feet because I am falling in a curvature. I am continuously falling towards the center of the Earth. Why am I falling? Because space-time is curved by the Earth, and so I am therefore falling towards the Earth. Why do I feel my weight? It's because the floor pushes back up on me. We're still using Newton's law in that way, and so there must be a force to resist that fall. And so my legs push up against the floor, push down against the floor, and the floor pushes up against my legs with equal and opposite force. That's Newton's law, we keep that. But the idea is that now we have effectively abolished the force of due to gravity by simply changing this curvature of space-time, and you simply follow the lay of the land, or the lay of space-time, and that gets you to where you need to go. All right, so this leaves a lot of hang-ups because people, when they talk about space-time, they get all hung up about it and they say, well, it's not really curved. It's like, no, but you have to add in the concept of space and time. Because Newton's laws assume a universal time. But we already know that when you talk about relativity, space and time are interlinked. That's what special relativity showed us. Now the addition of mass simply adds to curvature of space-time. So therefore, John Wheeler quoted the famous quote that everybody always says, that mass tells space-time how to curve, and curved space-time tells mass how to move. And we always say that, okay, well, what's it curved into? It's like, you could posit an extra, an extra spatial dimension, if you wish, in order to accommodate this curvature. That's fine. Uh, many relativists do that, and they call that the bulk. And so, therefore, well, we can't perceive that bulk space. We only perceive it in the sense that we are falling into it in a very strange way. Um, so that's our perception of it because as the curvature flow into, into the bulk, which would be the extra spatial dimension, that's what's posited in any event, or at least one way of explaining it, is that you, uh, you fall towards this extra, towards matter curves into that extra spatial dimension. Well, um, but however, if you look at the actual mathematics of, like from any standard general relativity textbook, you don't actually need that extra spatial dimension in order to explain curvature. Because you can create a mathematical space that has curvature, but doesn't have a radius of curvature inside an alternate space. That way you can have arbitrarily curved spaces. So you basically do measurements of path lengths inside of this space-time. And so you find the shortest path lengths inside of this space-time. And you have to divest yourself away from the concept that a coordinate system is the same thing as the distance. So 
coordinates in a space-time can be deceptive, meaning one step in one direction could be longer than a step in a different direction. So steps are simply coordinates, but their actual path length may be longer depending on the curvature of space-time. So that kind of helps a little bit about it. But really what we have to think is, is the nature of general relativity simply says that we no longer need a force due to gravity. Because remember Einstein said that the force due to gravity attributed to Newton, Newton's force due to gravity is instantaneous. It goes across the entire cosmos instantly. But in order to take care of that, we instead use curvature of space-time, which allows then the propagation of changes in space-time. So that, that leads us to the next bit, which is tests. Okay, this is a great idea, fine, we can do play curvature, makes the mathematics a little more complicated, but yet it then explains what Newton said he could not explain. Newton said, I have no idea why gravity works the way it does, it just seems to, and I have no idea why inertial mass is the same as gravitational mass, they just seem to be the same. Einstein said, they are the same, and the reason for the agent is simply curvature of space-time. So, you use the, the, the two problems that Newton said, well, I don't know what they are, and you start with them as postulates, and that gives you general relativity. All right, so this is a great idea, but what does it predict? If you combine space-time and you combine them together, the first thing I talked about last time uh, was the precession due to uh, precession of Mercury's orbit around the Sun, and we found that, the, that Mercury's orbit is about 574 arc seconds per century. That's what's observed, but Newtonian mechanics only gets 531 of those arc seconds per century, and so there's a discrepancy. And people throughout the uh, uh, latter part of the 19th century were trying to figure out ways to tweak Newton's laws. But when Einstein came up with general relativity, he said, wait a second. Let's look at, let's take specifically Mercury's precession. You solve the equations according to, according to space-time with, with, with the sun here, the Mercury there, and guess what? The 43 arc seconds that are required fall directly out of Einstein's equations, and you get the extra, the exact 574 arc seconds of change. That is a direct result of general relativity. You don't have to change anything. You get what's observed. All right, that's pretty cool. So what's observed can be explained by the equations. That's nice. But then remember, Ptolemy's equations explained the observations, and they were kind of twerky. So we don't really care. That's not really the best way. We want to say, all right, what does, ninth, what does Einstein's theory predict that can then be observed? That's a better thing. So the Einsteinian theory of general relativity predicted that space-time is curved around around stars, because stars are massive, and the sun is a star. So we should see, actually, the change in trajectory of light, or the apparent bending of light, because the path, the path through space-time near the sun is different than the path through space-time far away from the sun. So the sun changes the path that light takes. So when we look at something that's going towards the sun, that coming by the sun, we would see it actually to be in a different place in the sky. So it was a prediction that the stars surrounding the sun at a total solar eclipse in 1919 would actually show different positions in the sky. They would be farther apart from the sun than they were when, they're, when the sun isn't there. So what Arthur Eddington did in 1919 is he sent an expedition of, I believe, it was South Africa to actually watch the solar eclipse and they went down very early to take pictures of the sky, of what the, uh, of what the stars look like. Without the sun in front of them, the sun and moon in front of them, they waited a few months for the sun to get to the same position in the sky where the solar eclipse was going to be. And what did they see? They saw the stars spread apart because the light that was going, so the stars were coming to, directly to them. But then what happened was is that instead, light that is going in this direction, a little farther apart, then gets pulled back towards us. And so when we look at it, the angular separation of the stars widens as opposed to narrows. So the position of stars in the sky was predicted to be apart, and the amount of that prediction was predicted by Einstein and observed by Eddington in 1919. And subsequent to that, other applications like starlight uh, positions of spacecraft have to be checked because if they're on the far side of the sun, say they're on Mars or something, on Jupiter, 
and have to take into account general relativity in order to see where they are in the sky. And other eclipses have shown this as well using radio astronomy because it's a little easier to look at radio sources behind the sun because uh, the sun is not as loud in radio and so it's also easier to observe. So this has been observed again and again, and it led to a famous quote when it was observed in 1919, and reporters asked Einstein, uh, what would happen if Eddington had not seen it? And he said, well, I would pity God for the equations are correct. And that was an interesting thing to say. So another thing that are predicted by a general relativity are gravitational arcs. So if you have a galaxy that's very, very distant and another galaxy that's in front of it, the light from that would pass around and be distorted and you have a distorted image of a galaxy that's in the background with respect to a foreground galaxy. Those things have been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope and SCADS, lots of galaxy clusters where there's a huge mass of galaxies and the light from background galaxies gets distorted and changed into strange shapes which then you can think about, you can reconstruct the original appearance of the background galaxy in just the same way that an ophthalmologist can uh, reconstruct what eyeglasses to give to you because the gravity, the gravity of the foreground uh, cluster acts as a lens. All right, that's another prediction. A further prediction is that if a body is rotating, like the Earth or the Sun is rotating as a massive body, then space-time itself is dragged along with that rotation, which is a really weird concept. It's called frame dragging. And this prediction was a long time coming, uh, and it was finally observed by the Gravity Probe B, which was basically a perfect gyroscope that orbited the Earth. And the prediction from which how, how the gyroscopes would change with respect to time due to the rotation of the Earth, as the Earth rotates, it drags space-time around it with it. And that there's a certain amount of dragging that was uh, expected. Basically, the, the satellite was trying to point to this very dire this direction, and the gyroscopes in it were dragged a little bit to the side, according to, as the Earth rotation, the, the orientation of the uh, of the, of, of the gyroscopes inside the spacecraft was changed. So Gravity Probe B, well, it took five years of data after it deconstructed it, actually discovered this frame dragging effect which is predicted by Einsteinian relativity. Next, in 19, well this was like about five years ago, uh, but in 1974, another major prediction of it is that if you have two massive bodies that are close to each other, really massive, and they're orbiting each other as a binary pair, then they'll actually, they're, they're, the rate at which they orbit each other will decrease and they'll get closer and closer and closer and orbit faster and faster and faster. And Hulson Taylor found using a radio telescope at uh, Arecibo in 1974 a pair of pulsars, but neutron stars, which we'll talk about later. These neutron stars are orbiting each other and the rate at which they change their orbital period uh, is a direct prediction of general relativity. So general relativity predicted this, this behavior and it was observed around this kind of object. But, it, and the, what, how were they changing? Well, the change happened because the, because the prediction of general relativity says is that the change in space time, meaning the instantaneous problem that Einstein talked about originally, is that the change in space and time due to the motion of objects has to spread out and has to, it can't go instantaneously. It has to go at the speed of light. And if it goes at the speed of light, by the time something moves over here that's really massive and moving very fast, then there would be a gravitational wave, a wave in space and time, a disturbance, if you will, in, the space, in space and time, propagates outward. And that radiates energy away, which allows the two neutron stars to get closer and closer together and their periods of orbit change. And that's a direct prediction of general relativity, and that was observed in 1974 by Halston Taylor. And for it, they got the Nobel Prize in 1993. And finally, well actually, I think we got two, one last really good one. In September of 2015, the LIGO group, after 30 years of work, discovered gravitational waves that were due to the collision of two black holes. And the gravitational waves happened in a similar way to Pulse and Taylor, but it's the final in-spiral of two massive black holes that stretched and squeezed space-time. And these waves propagated out through space and caused the detectors to literally squish and stretch and squish and stretch by the tiniest amount, an incredibly small amount, at the distance we are from them. But the, but the distance we are from them, uh, it gives a, but the still, even though they're distant, 
the way in which they, the, the detectors stretched and squished had a prediction according to general relativity, according to the merging of two black holes. You would see this, and that's what they looked for, and that's what was observed. And so this is apparently yet another major confirmation of general relativity. And finally, just to finish off with something more prosaic, um, when you drive your car, you have these satellites above you helping you get directions, either through Siri or through Android or what have you, or, or your maps phone, your map app. And guess what? If, your, if the general relativistic corrections were not put into the software for your GPS system, doesn't matter what's doing it, if those general relativity connection, corrections, due to the light travel time, due to the fact that the Earth is a gravita uh, has gravitational effects all around it, then guess what? You would be lose your location on the surface of the Earth by about a mile after about 15 minutes. So you have to take into account general relativity in order for the global positioning system to work. So all of these things go together. And all of it is premised on the concept that space and time are the same, that mass and energy cause curvature of space-time. And curvature of space-time is the explanation for this feeling that we have that we call weight. It is the and, and it also explains the nature of the acceleration that we feel due to gravity. And it gets rid of the need for a force due to gravity. It is simply the curvature due to gravity. But so, but, you know, we don't necessarily have to drop all of Newton's laws. Because general relativity, when I talk to pretty extreme environments like Newtonian physics, uh, I mean, uh, neutron stars and black holes. But this leads us to what we call the correspondence principle, is that any theory that, is, uh, that replaces a previous theory, it must incorporate all the observations of the previous theory or find a, a space in which that works. So when we look at Newton's laws, so Kepler came out with his three laws of motion of the planets, and they were correct for the sun and for the planets. Well, when Newton came out with his laws, he was able to explain all of Newton's laws and also expand upon it to see how other stars might behave. And it would also that allowed it to predict the location of Neptune. Kepler's laws couldn't predict Neptune, but Newton's laws could if you saw disturbances inside or discrepancies. So Newton's laws had Kepler's laws in them, and but they expanded and allowed us to do other things. But Newton's laws had their problem areas, and Einstein's laws came along. Einstein's theory of relativity came along, and said, "Well, if we apply this idea, oh wait, in the slow regime, meaning speeds not as not close to the speed of light, and not an extreme curvature of space and time, not near supermassive objects, and not going very fast, then general relativity becomes Newtonian mechanics." And in fact, that's why we don't throw out Newton's laws. They're still useful. They're incredibly useful. But if we want to actually measure using a GPS our location to a couple of feet as opposed to a couple of miles, if we want to get a spacecraft exactly to a location on Mars, if we just want to get it to Mars, Newton's laws are great, to within a couple hundred miles. But if we really want to get to a specific location in Gale Crater right next to this place, then we need general relativity. So, Relativity encapsulates or holds Newtonian physics, and Newtonian physics holds previous things, but notice they supersede other things too. Like Newtonian laws and Kepler's laws superseded uh, Ptolemy's laws. Well, Ptolemy created the geocentric model, right? Now, his mathematics was extremely complex, and it had flaws. It could not correctly predict the phases of Venus, but Newton's laws could. So we discard all of Ptolemy's laws. Now the funny thing is, is that if we wanted just to simply know the positions of things in the sky, Ptolemy's laws were, were very complicated, but useful. And that's why they were used for a long time, is they were useful. But once we get to something, we're gonna go past usability and into explanation and find explanations for deeper and deeper and deeper and finer and finer ideas, and finer and finer observations and corrections to problems, then we have to go deeper and deeper theories. So the essence of general relativity is that so far it has been unchallenged and people have looked for discrepancies between the inertial mass and the gravitational mass and have found none. It's one of the best recorded things, the best measured efforts because when you say this, 
this is a this is a challenge and people say okay I'm gonna prove you wrong mr. Einstein because if I can prove you wrong I'm gonna get the Nobel Prize but the funny thing is is that general relativity keeps coming back and every test the test of the equivalency of the inertial mass and the gravitational mass keeps coming back as positive you know, they're the same thing so this postulate is testable and it stands up to tests so we have great confidence that general relativity is a very good approximation for what the universe really does. And that's going to have implications when we talk about cosmology, when we talk about black holes, when we talk about neutron stars, lots of things that happen in astronomy as a result of general relativity. And we'll all talk about those things soon as we come along in the course. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we were trying to finish up gravity, but I promised you a couple latter things based on the nature of how we know that gravity implies space-time curvature. Remember, the, all of our difficulties that we've had throughout all of these videos is that we've tried to establish what gravity is. Newton didn't say that there was any particular agent to gravity, he just described how it worked. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take it a step further and say the following thing is that gravity is a result of the curvature of space-time and things moving through space-time according to that curvature. And where does the curvature arise from? The curvature arises from the presence of matter, the presence of energy in space-time. So it's kind of a, a feedback loop. So space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. And that particular quote, uh, that little aphorism, comes from John Wheeler who coined it some time ago. In any event, so let's see what we mean by curved space-time because that's a very strange notion for a lot of people. People bark, balk at it a lot. Okay, so let's begin by looking at what we mean by measurement. Again, we have to go all the way back to measurement because measurement is the key to anything in science. So what are we going to measure? We're going to measure things inside a laboratory, such inside this room or something. Um, so there's basically four situations that we want to think about and think about the result of things moving inside those four situations. The first one is the easiest to think about, although the, it's the one that nobody ever encounters. So let's take this room that we're in and we go out deep into space, in between the stars, far, far, far away from any planet, any star, anything. We're really out in the middle of nowhere in space. We're not talking between Earth and Mars. We're talking between the stars, light years away from anything big. All right, so if you were in such a room, you would be floating. I mean, where's gravity? Where's up and down? There is no gravity. There's no gravity. So therefore, you're just floating. You'd be just as, as likely to be on the ceiling as you are on the floor, as on a wall or in a corner or something. So inside your room, you would be floating. And But here's the difference, is that all the laws of physics stay the same. Okay, so another idea is that let's say you're falling inside of a gravitational field. Um, I had the experience of that once when I was in the World Trade Center and we went up to the 70th floor and then from the 70th floor, roughly just before we got to our stop, the elevator cable sort of broke or it actually loosened or something and we plummeted down to about the 30th floor. So we had about 40 floors of free fall. That's no fun. So. I, you know, the elevator brakes kicked in, so I'm okay, and, but the, I was really felt for the pregnant woman right next to me. In any event, so uh, that ended up being a very strange experience because of free fall. Now, when you fall freely inside of a gravitational field, you feel like you're floating. It really does feel that way. You, you're lighter and everything. But in any event, that's the second situation, is that you're freely falling in a gravitational field. Okay, now what's the four, third situation? The third situation is, you will be in a room just like this on the surface of the earth. All right, that's normal. And then let's actually make up a kind of a funny one in that let's pretend for just a second that this room 
all of a sudden has some magic alien that comes to it, straps a bunch of rockets around the outside of the room, and within just a fraction of a second, the tiniest fraction, so I don't notice it or nobody inside the room notices it, the engines turn on, they have a thrust of exactly 1G, and the Earth is removed out from underneath. So this is a rather elaborate pl prank being played by these crazy aliens, whoever they might be. So we can imagine then we're in the middle of a rocket, and the rocket is accelerating upwards at 1g, so which is the same acceleration that you feel if you drop something on the Earth. So, the, so there's our four situations. One, completely out in the middle of space with nothing around us. Two, freely falling inside that same room, but then the room is falling in a gravitational field and we're not worried about wind resistance or burning up in an atmosphere or anything like that. We're just gonna get rid of that for now. The next one is we're standing on the surface of the Earth and we're seeing how things work inside the room. And the fourth one is we're in a rocket that's accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, the funny thing is, is that Einstein's theory of relativity says the following that all freely falling frames, all freely falling reference frames are equal. Another way of saying it is that you don't feel your own weight while you're falling. That's another way of saying it. So if we have that, then if you look at the first two situations, way out into space and falling in a gravitational field. And oh, the second postulate is in every freely falling reference frame, all of the laws of physics are the same in any given one. So you have one over here and one over there, they happen to be freely falling. Each of the internal people would measure the same things and see the same, uh, uh, see the same laws of physics. There would be no difference between them. Now they might be going in different directions, that's a different thing, but direction doesn't matter. We're talking about the laws of physics themselves. Okay, so let's just look at that first pair, the first pair and play a game. And the first game is, now I'm floating in space, and I take out my laser, and I shoot my laser across the room. Now, if I'm freely falling in the middle of interstellar space and there's nothing around, we expect the laser to go straight across the room and hit a target on the other side. And the target goes ping when it, it gets a, when it, the laser hits it. So maybe we're having a funny little sort of, sort of a Coney Island version of this thing. So you got a laser on one side and the thing goes ping on the other and says, I, may, I got hit by the target. So the target gets hit and makes a ping noise. Uh, whatever. Or just simply records it. But I like the ping sound because it's fun. Anyway, so... What happens then if we say that all freely falling reference frames are equal? Now, is that person way out in space freely falling? The answer is, well, he's certainly not not falling. How do you like that for a way of talking? He's certainly not not falling, so therefore he is falling. He's basically not falling anywhere, so that since he's not falling anywhere, he's kind of falling in place. And another way of thinking that is, there's no gravity, so he doesn't feel anything, so he's basically floating, and so floating, without falling is the same thing as falling. So if they're the same thing, then here's what the person sees if he's in the room. So now I'm in the room, I'm floating because now I'm falling towards the earth at relatively speed. I'm picking up at 9.8 meters per second squared, getting rid of all the atmosphere, not worrying about that. And I take my laser and point it across the room. What do I see inside the room? I'm freely falling towards the surface of the earth. Don't worry about that crash landing. I got airbags and everything like that and the cables will stop, whatever. But I shoot my laser across the room, it hits the target and goes ping. It's the same as if I'm in deep space. So those two are equal. But there's a difference. In the first instance, way out in deep space, let's say now I've got a buddy of mine and a buddy of mine is outside the spaceship and he's looking in and he sees me playing around with this laser and says, don't point that in my eyes, buddy. And so yeah, I'm shooting this across and he sees me hit the target. All right. So now, let's say my buddy is, is standing far away from me as I'm falling inside the room towards the surface of the earth. He feels helpless. He can't see, he can't help me stop falling, but he sees me falling. There's a difference. It's actually falling in a gravitational field. Now, he also, I mean, remember, the laser goes across the room, hits the target, and says ping. Right. Now, what does my friend who's far away see? So let's just, uh, just for the sake of argument, I'm gonna call him Tony. He says, Tony is outside, he's looking at me falling down. I got my laser, I shoot it across. What does Tony see? Well, he also sees the target get hit by the laser because 
the laser has to hit the target. There's no such thing as not hitting the target just because you're looking at it from a different perspective. So the laser goes across the room and hits the target. But I'm falling towards the earth. So Tony sees the following. He sees the entire thing falling downward and it takes a little bit of time for the laser to go across the room as it's falling. So there's a height change, which means that the target changes position from when the laser was fired. So the laser and target were here at the time of firing and at the time of pinging, they're here. So the only way it could have possibly hit across is if the laser, if it starts here and then it goes across and down. So according to Tony from the outside, the laser does a curved path downward towards the direction that you're falling. Wow. So from the outside, it looks deflected. From the inside, it looks the same. That's principle of relativity. And that makes sure that we actually have a laser firing and a target being hit. So what does that mean? That means that we are seeing that there are two equivalent reference frames. The both of them are freely falling, but one of them is falling in a gravitational field. So therefore the path is bent according to outside observers. Inside, you see it's uh, sh shooting straight across, but outside, because I can perceive your law, your gravity, because I see the elevator falling, because Tony sees me falling. Tony sees me falling in the gravitational field, so he must see the path of light bent. Okay, that's all very interesting, um, which shows that there's a change in the path according to an outside observer. An outside observer sees the curvature of light. Ah, all right, so now, what do we get from the other two examples? So, but remember, okay, let's just go back. So why don't I see this curvature going on? Because I'm freely falling with the reference frame. So as I freely fall, I see it, I'm watching it go as it goes. I am in a local inertial reference frame. I'm locally, so I'm locally falling. So this local thing is the same. All of the laws of physics are the same inside my room no matter what. So it's got to go in a straight line. If it did curve, I'd go, what's going on there? It'd be something strange going on because then why is the light all of a sudden changing direction? Since there's no additional laws of physics just because I'm falling in the inside of the room, then the light must go straight across the room inside of the falling room. Okay, so now we have two more situations to look at. Let's say instead I'm standing, well, let's make it easier. Let's go to the rocket example. So now I'm gonna go to the rocket. And now I'm standing at the bottom, on the floor of a rocket, and the rocket is going upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, that just so happens to be the same acceleration due to gravity that we feel on Earth. So what do I get? I'm standing on the bottom of the rocket, the rocket's going upward, I shoot a laser beam across the room, and what do I see? Inside of this reference frame, uh-oh, I see it go straight across. I see it go straight across, but I also see it bend downward. I see it bend downward. So this is kind of a crazy thought. Why do I see it bend downward? Because what does my friend Tony see from the outside? Tony, from the outside, sees the following. The rocket is going upwards, so he's perceiving my acceleration as movement, as actual speed, a speed change. Since it's an acceleration upwards, he sees the rocket doing the following. I shoot my laser across the room, and, what does, and then what occurs? Well, the rocket goes up. Now, in normal space, remember there's no gravity with the rocket thing, there's, we're not rocketing off of the surface of the Earth, we're simply rocketing in space in, without the presence of any mass or anything like that. What do, does Tony see away just simply as a result of the rocket speeding up with acceleration? He sees the following, the laser going straight across. But what does that mean, the laser going straight across? When I shoot the laser, it goes straight across the room. But Tony sees the fact that the rocket is going upwards and, and there's nothing attaching the laser to the rocket. It's not like I'm attached to the laser. It's like a thing that is like a brick or a whole thing. No, the, the photons are free and they travel across the way. And this as a result of the fact that the speed of light is the same for all observers. Okay, so the speed of light goes across. I mean, the light goes across as a laser and because the rocket's accelerating upwards, the target on the far side of the wall goes up a little bit after 
the fact that as, as the target moves, as the laser source moves, the target moves up. So therefore, in order for, so what Tony sees is that he sees the laser hit lower towards the floor because the floor kind of comes up to meet the laser. That's what happens. So Tony sees from the outside, when I shoot a laser across, that it hits the bottom of the, of, he sees, he perceives, and he is correct, that he sees it hit basically by the floorboards. So you got a floorboard hit. But what I see, I see it simply bending downward. Why? Because the path of light is straight. Since the path of light is straight, then therefore the path is straight, but the rocket's moving. Since the rocket's moving, the path then becomes curved to an observer inside the rocket. Okay. Now one of the more important principles of the principle of equivalence according to Einstein, leads us to an amazing, amazing idea that there is no difference between an acceleration due to gravity and an acceleration due to motion. Meaning the mass that you feel, the ma mass measurements, there's no difference between inertial mass and, and, uh, and gravitational mass. Since there is no difference between the inertial and gravitational mass, forces and accelerations act the same on everything, right? So let's look at what this means for us. You can't tell an acceleration due to speed compared to an acceleration due to gravity. They're the same thing. It's just an acceleration. There's no, oh, acceleration due to gravity. Oh, acceleration due to speed. They're separate laws of physics. No, they're the same laws. Since they're the same laws, they're the same acceleration. So if I were now to simply park myself on the surface of the Earth and point my laser across the room, the laser should bend downwards. And that's what I see inside the room. So four separate situations with a laser going across the room. The first situation, we're out in deep space. The laser goes across the room from a source to a target. The target goes ping. It's a straight line according to me because I'm floating in space and according to Tony who's outside watching it because there's no motion. Second, we then put the whole room inside, uh, let it fall in a gravitational field. The target falls as, it falls as I fall. So Tony from the outside sees that the target goes down. So there from the outside, the path changes and becomes bent. However, inside, I see a straight line because I'm freely falling. Now, we take away the idea of freely falling because now we say, well, if we're freely falling, then the gravitational field must bend the light. So if we take away the aspect of freely falling and have something kind of pushing back up against us, maybe the floor. So the floor is pushing back up so that we don't fall through the floor. But the bending still occurs. And so inside of the, inside the rocket, the rocket goes across as the, the target goes up as after and it meets the uh, and so therefore the light goes straight across as viewed by Tony from the outside because we're very far away from everything way out in deep space this is the rocket in deep space accelerating thing the line is straight and so then Tony sees it hit the far target and ping and the target is at the floorboard that's the only place where it'll hit therefore it, since that situation is identical to what we have on earth the laser simply must bend downwards in a gravitational field. Now, how much does it bend in a gravitational field at the surface of Earth? Not a lot. It's a very small amount. The radius of curvature is on the order of a couple light years if we approximate the bending by a circle. So yeah, it's not something you can easily measure. But that's the idea that but in stronger gravitational fields, it becomes more important. So that's a, a one example of the nature of, of curvature of space. The, that's what we mean by curvature. Curvature is you can't necessarily put the same coordinate system on every place in all of space time because you have changing core, you have changing aspects to it. Uh, the universe, uh, space time changes, or at least the uh, rate by which things fall inside that space time changes as based on the location that you are in that space time. So you have local little places where things behave very similarly, but there's lots of little local places. In fact, there's many, many local places. Lot, every place is a local place. So locally inside these tiny places, in tiny, tiny rooms, there are no changes in, uh, due to the falling, freely falling in space time. Okay. Next time, we'll go the other way, upwards.
Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we talked about the nature of the bending of light due to gravity. So let's finish this off. Let's finish off the basic tests of, co of, of general relativity, or at least the basic tests of the concept of the principle of equivalence. So last time I elucidated that there were four basic situations, or more specifically, two pairs of situations. The first one is the idea that Einstein thought that was, was his brilliant idea, and one of the happiest moments of his life, this is what he said, is that the, you cannot tell your own weight while you're falling which means that there's no difference between being deep out into space, far away from any planet or any star or anything, just in the middle of space floating, and simply falling in a gravitational field. So those two things are identical. There is nothing different about them to the person doing the falling. So if we were in this room and we were out deep into space, I'd be floating, everything would be floating, there'd be no up, there'd be no down. Likewise, if we were placed the same room and let it fall in a gravitational field, the same thing would be in effect. Okay, so the other pair of things is essentially the same thing as the previous pair, except that you have something pushing back, like the floor. So instead of freely falling, you're simply on the floor and the floor is pushing back. Well, how's that two situations? The first situation is that you're in a room very much like this on the surface of the earth and here you are. The other one is as if you're in a rocket and the rocket is accelerating upwards and that you're on the floor of the rocket and the rocket is accelerating upwards at exactly the same rate that something falls on the surface of the earth how surface of the earth how it falls which is about 10 meters per second or 9.8 meters per second squared so if you were accelerating upwards in a rocket that could be that's indistinguishable from if you're standing on the earth now i had an interesting person on facebook send me a note saying oh well actually gravity the, gra the speed upward thing is not the same as being on the earth all right i'll grant you that because his example was let's make the, the spaceship 200 miles long so if the spaceship is 200 miles long and as it accelerates it accelerates as a unit and as it does so, everybody in that 200 mile long segment of, of ship experiences the same acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. However, if we had the same 200 meter ship and it was not launched yet, and it's at the surface of Earth, then the people at the bottom of the spacecraft, it's 200 miles high now, would experience 9.8 meters per second squared. But somebody in the cockpit, way at the top, 200 miles up, would have a much lower, lower gravity, would, would feel the lesser effect of gravity because they're literally higher up. Now, why don't we really care about that? That's not of importance to us but because remember, the principle of equivalence is only between what we call locally inertial reference frames. So you can't really compare those two because absolutely they're different. There's no question they're different. That's how you could detect them. But I was, I've always posited the idea that we're in a room that's relatively small, not infinite in extent, not enormous in extent, and neither did Einstein and neither do the constructs of general relativity. So general relativity does not do that. It looks for locally inertial reference frames. Or, even more specific, momentarily local inertial reference frames, meaning at this moment, it's a locally inertial reference frame. So the mathematics of general relativity does take that into account, um, but that's a really good point by, that, by the person who caught me on YouTube with that, which is really great. Okay, so um, let's look at the next step. The next step in this total analysis is the first one, the, because the first one, we shown a laser across the room, and we demonstrated that in a room where the laser is going across, in a gravitational field, it bends downward into the gravitational field. So if I have a laser, I'm shooting across the room, it doesn't hit straight across the room, it hits a little lower than across the room. And that's because space-time is curved very slightly at the surface of Earth um, so, that light, so that light bends downward. And by very slightly, I mean if it's 10 meters, the, light, the, the laser is traveling. The curvature downward is on the order, if you make a circle to approximate it, it's on the order of a light year or two. So you're not going to really notice that too much at the surface of the Earth. And so therefore, the surface of the Earth, the space-time is not strongly curved. So that's an important point. But yet, it is curved enough to make us feel what we call weight. All right. So let's look at the next step. Instead of shooting the laser across and seeing its trajectory bend downward, let's shoot the laser up. How does that change things? If we shoot the laser up, let's go out and look at our four, our four situations, deep in space, falling to the Earth, in a rocket, deep in space, or on the surface of the Earth. 
So there are four different uh, setups. Let's look at the easiest one, deep in space. So again, uh, firing a, rock, a laser up or left doesn't matter whether you're deep in space. So in deep space, the, the laser is always stays the same wavelength. It must stay the same wavelength. It's a monochromatic laser. It must stay the same wavelength. It must reach the other side. Um, the size of everything is there's no change. But remember, all freely falling reference frames are identical. And a freely falling reference frame is deep in space. That's also the same as if we're falling in a gravitational field. So take the same laboratory, again, small, not 200 miles long, but like 10 or 20 meters at the most, and let it actually fall in inertial in a gravitational field. You will not be able to tell if you're in the room falling. The laser, as you shoot it up, will have the same effect as if you're in deep space. It'll look to be the same. The tri inside to you, there will be no change at all. So. But now that we, we said last time, we talked about my friend Tony. So Tony is out in deep space with me, looking at me, falling towards the earth. He sees me shooting the laser up. He thinks it's a cry for help or something. Uh, but no, I've got, I've got airbags. I'm going to be fine. I got a parachute. I, I just haven't seen to deploy them yet. In any event, so what does Tony see? Tony sees the entire setup falling to earth. And as he sees it falling to earth, he sees a change. He notices that I'm in a gravitational field. He sees that it's different than deep space. So what's the difference? Well, I shoot the laser upwards. By the time it gets to the ceiling, the ceiling has descended. So therefore, the entire length of the path, according to Tony, is shorter. But I don't see a change. So if the length of the path is shorter, therefore, the entire wavelength, according to Tony, must be blue shifted. He has to see it blue shifted because that's the roof collapsing down, which actually at, gives a blue shift to the light at the receiver at the top of the room. So the light would see it, according to Tony. However, I don't see a change due to the principle of equivalence. Since I don't see a change, there must be a gravitational redshift that goes in exact proportion to the gravitational blue sh or the blue shift that is occurring as a result of me falling. Let's say that one more time. Okay, so I'm falling. As I fall, according to Tony, very distant, the roof is catching up where the roof has the detector on it. And so since it's compressing and moving towards the light, there is a Doppler shift. This Doppler shift makes it to be a shorter wavelength. Since it's a shorter wavelength, but that's what Tony should see. He says, oh, there should be a shorter wavelength. But I don't see it. I don't see it because the falling frame Falling to Earth is the same as being in deep space, so which, would, which, which would have no change. So for me to see absolutely no change, there must be a gravitational redshift that exactly counterbalances the blue shift that occurs as I'm falling. Okay, so that leads us to the next two. So let's just posit that for that exists, that there's a gravitational redshift that counteracts the known Doppler shift because the known Doppler shift happens because Doppler shift is a fact of life uh, that happens to both sound and light. So there should be blue, it should be blue shifted, but it's not. So therefore there must be a gravitational redshift. So let's get, let's, let us land softly on the surface of the earth. The gravitational redshift should still be there so if the gravitational redshift should still be there, but now I'm not falling, I'm simply standing, experiencing gravity. Therefore, if I shoot the laser up, we get rid of the blue shift aspect and we only have the gravitational redshift of a laser shooting upwards. So therefore, if you were to shoot a laser up a very tall building, maybe 20 meters, let's even say 20 or 30 meters, the, li the light at the, that received at the top of the tower that you shot from the bottom of the tower, the laser going from the bottom of the tower to the top, should be redshifted, meaning longer wavelength. And that's what's observed. This has been observed experimentally, which is really fascinating. So there is a change in due to the gravitational field. And just for rounding out purposes, let's look at the fourth situation way out into deep space. So if I'm in deep space, and I'm accelerating upwards because I'm in a rocket that's accelerating upwards, I don't see any difference except like it feels like a gravitational redshift to me. So for me, I see it being a redshift. That's fine. It's the same as being on Earth. But what does my friend Tony see who's far away and outside? How does he perceive it? Well, he perceives it in the following way. 
as I, after I shoot the laser, the laser tries to catch up with the roof that's receding away. And again, that's a, that's a Doppler shift. And so there's a Doppler shift according to Tony because the roof is receding away from the laser. So Tony says that I should see it being redshifted, and I do. So there you go. So it's a very interesting thing that shows the equivalence of, of falling in a gravitational field to actually, um, to, for, to, for, to freely falling. Every freely falling reference frame is identical. That's the current idea about real general relativity that's really fascinating. And funny enough, it's actually borne out by experiment, which is really kind of strange. But let's actually take apart this thing about going shooting a laser straight up and down. Um, we saw before in a previous lecture how we looked at like a, a, like a relativist, a special relativistic clock where the laser bounced up and down inside a tube and we just had to move, the tube moved to the left and that actually gave us the speed of things and showed that we have a time dilation. Ah, time dilation. But wait a second. Let's go back and look at our gravitational redshift a little bit more carefully. So I take my laser, I shoot it to the ceiling, it experiences a redshift. But remember, the wavelength and frequency of light, the product of the wavelength of light times its frequency equals the speed of light, which is a constant. It is never changes. Remember, the speed of light is a constant no matter who's doing the observing. So, if I'm going to look at that that way, if the wavelength of light has changed to be bigger, then the frequency must change to be smaller. So that means that a smaller frequency means a larger time interval. So what we're actually showing, because the frequency is an inverse of a time interval. Like, uh, to be specific, the speed of light is uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And the, what, what are the units of wavelength? The units of wavelength are meters. What are the units of frequency? Hertz. A hertz is a cycle per second, or a wave per second, or a unit per second, or something happening every second. So it's 1 over seconds. So that's an inverse of a time, and an inverse of a time is just a, well, inverse of an inverse of a time is a time. So when we look at the reciprocal of a frequency, we get a time interval. So if you actually, if you make the wavelength longer, you must make the frequency shorter. If the frequency is shorter, it's reciprocal, a time interval is longer. So therefore, a clock r runs slower deeper in a gravitational field. And this also has been borne out by, by experiment, which is really something. In fact, the uh, clock differences between the satellites that manage your GPS system, so you, you, everybody uses GPS if you're in the Western world or Europe or, well, practically everywhere. It's actually pretty universal now. If the satellites and the GPS receivers that you use in an iPhone or a droid or a dedicated machine that actually does it, if those things did not take into account the time dilation effect due to the difference in altitude of the satellites way out in space, way out in orbit, high in orbit above the Earth, and the difference in this rate of progression of the clocks on the ground, if those two, if that was not taken into account, your GPS would be off it by a long distance in only a few hours. So. General Relativity's corrections to space and time are experimentally borne out. And that's a really weird thought. So, in sum, we've got two major things that really help us to, to try to convince us, to try to help convince us that space-time is curved. And one of them is the path of light being changed by going across a gravitational field, or even up or down a gravitational field, the path is changed. The length, uh, so a gravitation, a, the direction of light, or the direction of any falling object, uh, or a direction of any mo object moving through a gravitational field, is deflected by the gravitational field. So that is specifically light, that, because that makes it most dramatic. Um, but, the, but when we look at light specifically, it bends, it changes direction. So that feels like we should be thinking about curvature of space-time, because it follows the lay of space-time, because light always goes the straightest possible path. And since light goes straightest possible path, if that path is curved, then therefore space-time is curved. And then what about the time part of space-time? Well, we see that if we're deep in space, there's no change. But if we're in a gravitational field, we change lengths. Lengths change, meaning wavelengths. And therefore, time is changed, and as time is dilated, time changes. So we can think of time as curving 
towards a black hole, if you wish. Um, actually, that's not, or towards a gravitational, into a gravitational field. Meaning, the farther down in the gravitational field you go, the greater the time dilation exists. So, at the, so if you wish to live forever, or wish to live a long time, then fly at high altitude, become a, become a uh, pilot, or a, uh, or, or a, a airline, or somebody who works the, works the halls, in a, who works on a plane all the time. You might gain a quarter of a millisecond if you did it for 30 years. So, it's not a lot, but it's actually measurable, which is fascinating. So these things help us to elucidate the idea that, that space-time is curved. Um, but I'd like to finish with an alternate way of thinking about the nature of curved space-time. Frequently, and this is going to get kind of wonky and silly and, and mathy, so please bear with me. Um, I, I, <laughs> there's a researcher, Andrew Hamilton, over at, uh, over at Colorado, who has, uh, who, has, who has some really interesting thoughts about how you can reformulate the equations that show you how to measure the distance in space-time you go. So remember we looked at, we, we kind of tried to break up the two things, but really you got to put them together as two separate things because you don't always just point a laser up. You're pointing up into the side a little bit and you're not necessarily falling straight into a gravitational field. You're falling, you're falling maybe at an angle. So space and time therefore are linked. And so you have, if you want to know the total distance in space-time, not space or time, but a combination of the two, meaning space-time, which, which, is, uh, which is an invariant if you, if you change coordinates, which is what we mean by a metric. So this particular quantity of length in space-time, if you want to measure it, you can actually reformulate what we call the Schwarzschild metric. And the Schwarzschild metric is a way of determining the lengths of space-time near a spherical non-rotating star. So a really close approximation to most stars is the Schwarzschild metric. It's very close. It's also a very, the weakest limit of the Schwarzschild metric, meaning very low masses and very slow speeds, gives you what we would call Newtonian gravity. So taking the Schwarzschild metric and reducing it down to Earth-level type of things, it has a, it's a complicated equation, but the complicated equation can be reduced to what we call Newtonian gravitation, which is neat. So really, we can actually derive Newton's laws by looking at lengths in space and time, which is a really interesting thing. And I'll leave that to, to intrepid explorers of the internet. If you wish to go look up the Schwarzschild metric, in fact, I'll probably put a link for it below on the, on this, on this, uh, on the YouTube channel and so forth. But what we want to look at then is a different way of approaching it. So the Schwarzschild metric assumes that time changes and that lengths change as you get closer to a mass. But let's posit for a second a slightly different way of thinking about it. Imagine the following, that you're a fish and you're a salmon, specifically a salmon swimming upstream. And if you wish to swim upstream, you have to swim against the current. And the current goes fast enough that it tries to wash you back down. But if you're a very strong salmon and you don't get eaten by a bear, you make it all the way back up to the spawning pool and make babies and then that's the end of you as a salmon. But we can think of sw fish swimming upstream. So there's a current going against the fish swimming and the fish is going against the current. Now if the current is too strong, the fish gets walked, washed down the stream. This is the analogy we're going to work on. So imagine now that light is not is the fish. So light is the fish. If light is the fish, then space-time itself can be considered to be flowing. You can reformulate the Schwarzschild metric in order to do, look, make it look like that space is flowing, as though it's a rain model, as though space is raining towards mass. And as it rains towards mass, it drags anything with it and pushes it down as it as it falls. So it's not that you're falling in the lay of the land, it's that space itself is flowing like a river towards mass. And so light tries, it can only go at one speed, and it gets slowed down. Ah, this is different. It gets slowed down as it tries to swim against the flow of space. So space itself is flowing towards mass.
And as it flows towards mass, light can only go so fast, and the and the uh, what we call the Schwarzschild uh, radius or the radius of a black hole, that flow of space time equals the speed of light, and therefore the fish just stays. So we can look at it in a slightly different way. So let's look at our two previous examples, uh, starting with the time one. So as if we point our laser up, light is going up. We can think of the light as photons, as packets of light swimming against the flow of space time as they're raining down on top of it. And the fish, the photon fish, lose energy as they rise. So they have to expend energy as they rise against the current of space. So why do you feel weight? You feel weight on the floor because space-time is rushing through you, pushing you down towards the mass. That's a really interesting visual. And in fact, the mathematics work out to be exactly that. The, you simply transform the coordinates of the Schwarzschild metric into this rain metric, and they're equivalent. So you can actually speak of space-time as raining towards mass, or flowing towards mass, or that space and time flow towards mass. Hmm. So what about the bending of light that goes across? Well, um, take a waterfall and try to throw something through the waterfall across the waterfall. It's going to get picked up and get pushed down the waterfall. It's the same thing. So a waterfall model of space-time as it flows towards mass is extraordinarily elusive. Uh, it is, is very evocative and, in fact, mathematically equivalent to what we call the Schwarzschild metric. And the Schwarzschild metric itself uh, is is exactly uh, the thing that was was derived a lot, uh, back in the back in the early part of the 20th century by Carl Schwarzschild, and after he solved the equations of Einstein's relativity in order for a spherical non-rotating mass, and then that metric was re-derived in this rain metric many times. Um, but typically, you won't find this rain metric anywhere, but it's much easier to understand. Uh, we think of space-time as flowing towards mass, and in fact, mathematically, it's equivalent to the Schwarzschild metric, so it actually works. So let's, uh, let's and it actually, it's much more helpful to think of it that way. Rather than space-time being thought of as curved, it still is curved, but we can think of space-time as simply flowing. Uh, towards mass. But where does it go? See, you can replace the, then there's the age-old question. I hear it. I hear it out there. The old question of, well, if space is curved, what's it curving into? Can now be replaced by the even funnier question, well, if space is flowing towards mass, what's it flowing into? Like, where is it going? Uh, that's a good question. It's a good question. Can't really answer that one. Not going to try. Not going to try either one of those. Um, but we can probably answer them by getting close to the idea of what we call bulk space. And I'll invite you to go look at Kip Thorne's uh, websites and his videos on the nature of what bulk space is. We can think of, of an additional space uh, dimension, and that space dimension is the place into which it's flowing or curving. Um, that's another way of talking about it. Uh, so I invite you to go look that up, but that will take you down a deep, deep internet rabbit hole. So make sure you look up Kip Thorne and bulk, bulk, the bulk dimension. He used it in the movie Interstellar, so be, be prepared for that. Hello, it's Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to be talking about the tides. The tides. The tides, they come in, they go out, and yes, we do know why. So the tides go in and out because of gravity, or more specifically, the difference in gravity between two locations. See, when you fall in a gravitational field, that's actually kind of the explanation for the tides. You don't need to have the rotation or a center of mass or anything like that. That actually helps other things. But when you fall in a gravitational field, it depends on from where you're falling and with reference to other things. So we have a solid body known as the Earth, or a semi-solid body, or solid body, and then it's covered by water. The water gets affected differently than the, gra than the solid object of the Earth. But the key idea is that when you fall in a gravitational field, you don't feel your weight. And part of that is the actual, the, that subtle statement is the basis for understanding the tides. So what are, what's gravity again? Well, it's the force between two masses at a distance. So you take two little masses, whatever size they are, and you know, take their, and they have to be made of something, so these masses must be made of something, and what do they got to be made of? They've got to be made of matter, 
and matter has mass and mass gravitates other mass. So whatever the distance is between them, take the two masses, multiply them together, divide by the inverse of the distance squared, multiply by gravitational constant, which is discovered by other means, and that gives you the force due to gravity. Now, the force due to gravity from one mass and another mass is the trick, and tied to the difference between masses. All right, so when two things pull on each other, when they pull on each other, um, we always think of like the center of mass of two things when we say, oh, how big is this thing? The idealization of Newton's, sec of Newton's law of gravitation is that it's two point masses, not two distributed masses, but two point masses. So what we can do is we can think of when we think of the moon and the earth, we think of the mass being centered at the center of the earth and the mass being centered at the center of the moon. And it's those two centers that are attracting each other, not anything else. So, but really what we care about for the tides are say all the elements of the planet, not just the center, but the difference between the elements and the center. So that's going to be kind of obvious in a little bit. So let's actually just show the effect of the moon on all the elements of the Earth. So first and foremost, let's break it up and keep it really simple and just break it to a bunch, a series of objects on the surface. Then what we do is we say, fine, the magnitude of the force on these locations on Earth uh, is represented, say, by these yellow arrows. But the red arrow is the center of mass. So all of them but combined together. All the masses combined together must somehow equal that red mass, that red line. But let's see how that works. So the, uh, the center, the, each element is being attracted, each little element of the Earth is being attracted towards the moon according to the yellow arrows. And oh, that's all we really care about. So we'll call them test arrows because they're taking just like, you know, maybe a car on the surface of the Earth, a building, a, a mountain, a lake, um, a tiny pebble any of those things. And so they're all being attracted by the moon. And the only thing that we have to worry about is the acceleration that is experienced by that element on the earth due to the moon. And that's what those yellow arrows are. So now what we can do is we can say, fine, let's get to the system where let's change coordinates. We're going to change coordinates to the center of mass of Earth. Because we don't feel ourselves being pulled towards the moon, we feel ourselves being pulled towards the Earth. So we need to reference the Earth's pull. So we're gonna remove all of the elements, uh, the, the constant element, the center of mass being pulled towards the, towards the moon due to the Earth. So the Earth, all of the sum of everything of the Earth is the red. So we're gonna reduce all of the little tiny things by the big red arrow. And so when we do that, we find that there's a difference. The difference between the red arrow, which is the center of mass pull towards the moon, and the yellow arrow, which is the little tiny, the center of mass of the Earth is red, and the yellow arrows are all the tiny little pieces on the surface of the Earth and their acceleration, so the two different accelerations. So if you look, you see a blue arrow shows the difference between the two accelerations. All right, so now let's actually ignore the Earth's falling towards the moon. So if we ignore the Earth's falling towards the moon, we erase the red arrows and we're left with the blue arrows only. See what I mean? So then look at what we're left with. We're left with only the differences. And if we do that, uh, we just simply focus on them. We see that the differences pull in at the poles and at the towards on the, on the side of the Earth towards the moon. It's going towards the moon, but on the side away from the moon, it's actually the difference of acceleration at that element is outward away from the moon. Now this is interesting because this is actually what we see if we now let's, if we go over the entire surface of the Earth we see all these little elements all combined together. So the acceleration, the difference in acceleration, due to the Moon, um, so with the Earth with the Earth's acceleration towards the Moon subtracted out, which is what we don't feel. We don't feel ourselves accelerated towards the Moon. So we take away the the entire Earth's contribution falling towards the moon away, and we're left with the difference between the basically the moon's pull and the Earth's pull. So the difference between the moon's pull on the total Earth and our pull at this, at this one little location due to the moon. And what we're left with is the series of arrows that kind of spring out. 
Notice that uh, the series of arrows springs out on the side facing the moon and the, facing the moon and the side facing away from the moon. These are accelerations that are experienced at these locations. These are forces, force per unit mass at each location. And you can see that's the tides. The tides mean there's two bulges. One bulge is towards the moon and one bulge is away from the moon and it's actually compressing at the top. So the tidal is stretching. The difference, in excel, the difference in force experienced by the little places on the Earth due to the moon, uh, due to the difference in gravity at the surface of the moon, at the surface of the Earth due to the moon. So now, as the, as the Earth rotates, it drags that lump forward. So literally, the, move, the, the, uh, the force due to gravity, the difference in forces due to gravity on the side facing the moon Lifts the, uh, lifts the ocean higher and attracts it away from the poles, or at least 90 degrees away. And then on the other side of the Earth, it pulls it away from the Earth, and, and it basically has two tidal bulges. So there's a tide on one side of the Earth and a tide on the other side of the Earth, one side facing the moon and one side away from the moon. Now, the Earth's rotation causes friction on these tidal bulges, which is the oceans, and it drags them forward because the Earth's rotating fast compared to the moons going around the Earth. So as the Earth rotates, it drags the tides ahead of it, which means that the tidal bulge is ahead of the moon in its orbit. So, so you can see that as there we go, we see the tides moving ahead. But if the, since that's friction, that means there's a force that's trying to pull it back. And after an extraordinary period of time, eventually the tidal bulge of the Earth will line up with the direction towards the moon. That will take billions of years, and that will be a long time after humans are gone. But in this time, the event this, the moon will only be visible on one side of the Earth, because as the Earth's rotation slows down, the, the month also slows down, but the rotation of the Earth slows down until it matches the month. So, in a very distant future, the day will equal the month, and the moon will only be visible on one side of the Earth. Now, this is exactly the same thing that has already happened to the moon. If we look at the moon, we only see one side of the moon. The moon's day is equal to the month. It rotates once on its axis for every time it goes around the Earth. So there, that means that, that because, and this has happened so quickly, because the moon is much smaller than the Earth. So, as since it's much smaller, the, the tidal friction that occurred on the moon happened a lot longer ago, and it is now tidally locked. It will take much longer for the Earth to become tidally locked to the moon, because the moon's, the moon's mass is much less than the Earth's, so therefore the differential effects are smaller. So there we have it. There, this is the reason for the tides. The reason for the tides are because of the difference in, due to, difference in gravitational acceleration on all parts of the Earth compared to the acceleration due to all of the Earth towards the moon. So difference in the little one little place on the Earth compared to the center of mass of the Earth. And those two, that difference is the tides. So there we have it. In a long time from the future, there will be the month will equal the day. Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory or not really so introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to dive deep into special relativity and show people why that traveling faster than light isn't possible. Or more specifically, wishing don't make it so. So let's see why traveling faster than light, though it's magical to think about, isn't actually possible. All right, so faster than light speed travel is the staple of television and science fiction and movies on the interwebs and so forth. And everybody's coming up with some wild idea about how to go faster than the speed of light. And then, you know, on television shows, they just say it's you do some crazy engineering trick and all of a sudden you're going faster than the speed of light. You tweak this knob or dial this dial or plug this box into there. And if you build the right thingamadoodle and you plug the woozle compactorator into the ham trotical and it tram tiddles the tagaloo and voila, you're going faster than the speed of light. So faster than light travel or FTL is a staple of science fiction, but can it actually be done? And the answer is, no, too bad. Unfortunately for the future purveyors of fine hem trotticles, 
no one is going to go faster than the speed of light. Why? Well, there's two major rules. The first, which we'll discuss in some detail, is the rule are the rules of special relativity. And two, I'm just going to leave this really important thing out there. It's called the principle of causality. And uh, the reason we do that, I mean, in television, we don't necessarily think about these things. In shows, they don't really care about it. But in, it, because it makes time travel television much better and shows better because then you don't have this thing called causality and you don't have to worry about it. There are a lot of things wrong with that, but really causality is something we do have to discuss. So it's this thing called reality and special relativity just before I begin has been extraordinarily well tested, well understood. It's so incredibly in part of physics today that in fact the, the Parisian, the International Bureau of Standards in Paris uses, doesn't even define the speed of light anymore. It's by, de I'm sorry, they define the speed of light to be what, what, what we used to be measured and they use that definition to define either the second or the meter and so those those are the things that that speed of light is done and because of the trust that we have in special relativity. So let's go take a look at this thing called reality. The first of the two rules of special relativity. One, the laws of physics for all uniformly moving observers, no matter what the observer is doing, are all the same. Uniformly always means with a constant velocity. That means there's no acceleration, no rotation, no curves and twists to the motion. Either you're standing still or you're moving uniformly, meaning with a constant speed in one direction and not changing speed or direction or rotation while you're doing that. So basically, if you're standing still to somebody who's walking by you, then you seem to be moving to the person that's walking by you. Now the laws of physics, therefore, all of the laws of physics are the same for everyone if they're moving uniformly. It doesn't matter how they're moving so long as they're moving with a straight velocity. And this is a core, this is one of the set, the first of two great principles of special relativity. And it implies that there's no such thing as absolute rest. Somebody is always moving with respect to somebody else. That's what we mean by no absolute rest. There's no, uh, I mean, uh, apologies to the, the Buddha who is at the center of all creation sitting and uh, minding his mantras. But the idea is that there is no one place that is purely at rest where everything else is moving with respect to it that doesn't exist. So there's no such thing as an absolute speed. There's only relative speeds. And any uniformly moving observer can consider themselves to be at rest. If you're moving straight in a line, then you can be considered at rest, which is really interesting. Well, why? Well, um, think about it. I'll give you a chance to think about it. When you're on a subway platform and you're going on the subway, sure, there's some bounces, but if it's a smooth ride, you're moving 60 miles an hour or whatever it is. I mean, maybe that's really fast. Or if you're on an Asila between Boston and New York and you're on a straight track or road, you're moving 80 miles an hour. Or if you're in a plane, you're moving 400 miles an hour. And it, those things can all be seen to be at rest. You're not accelerating or decelerating. You're not turning. You're not twisting. And so everybody is, sees their own reference frame in every one of these things as normal. All of these things are seen as normal inside of an inertial reference frame. However, it's different for people looking at you. So every possible physical experiment that you might do, any measurement of distance, length, and time, and things thereof, will be the same, no matter what your speed is of your frame of reference. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we can say, well, we're gonna look at the second principle, and the second principle says that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, regardless of their motion relative to the source of light. That's kind of a weird one if you think about it, and we're gonna look at that in some detail in a short bit, but, the, but keep in mind that no matter how you're moving, no matter how anyone is moving with respect to you, no matter where the source of the light is, all people will always measure the speed of light to be the same, always. That's kind of what we said before, but this is different. So the speed of light, therefore, is a universal constant. It is a it is a constant that is applies to everything, so we can't send messages faster than the speed of light. And uh, we could uh, talk about why. And it, well, there's a funny thing you could say that we can't send them slower either. But that's a funny part. So, but the most important thing is that this this concept that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for everyone has been experimentally verified in many many cases. And the speed of light does not add or subtract to the relative motion of the observer or the emitter, which is really interesting. All right, so those are the two core principles of relativity. We'll see how they affect later. 
later, but let's go talk about the most important one for our time travel thing, which is the principle of causality. Principle of causality simply mean that anything that is in effect must be preceded by its cause. If I'm buttering some bread, and I'm, I'm, I'm at home buttering some bread and I'm making Texas toast, right? And I'm gonna grill that Texas toast on my grill. So what I do is I put the butter on the bread and I'm as I turn around to put it on my grill, I accidentally drop the bread, and of course, because it'll land butter side down. So why did it land butter side down? It's because I dropped it. So it doesn't just magically be on the floor by itself without somebody dropping it. Either somebody dropped it or threw it or pushed it there. It just doesn't appear there. And then all of a sudden is in my hand like, oh, wow, there it was on the floor. Now it's in my hand. No, we have an, a sense of causes and effects and there everything that must happen, that every effect must have a cause and its cause mu and the cause that causes an effect must be before the effect. It's an interesting thing. I use the example below of a baseball bat. But I like Texas toast just as much. Okay, so this principle of causality says if you do something and it causes something else to happen, then the thing that is caused to happen afterwards must happen afterwards. That's what we mean by causality. You kick the cat, cat meows. Oh, that's terrible to say. I like cats. I had a good cat. So you kick, uh, you kick, you kick, the fire hydrant and you scream so or more specifically kick the cat the cat bites you why did the cat bite you because you kicked it so don't kick cats okay great now measurement of length and time so this is an important thing that we have to deal with when we talk about this because measurements are everything what do we mean when we say going back in time well, we're measuring time of course so now we got to understand why a fa faster than light speed is faster than light travel is impossible we must understand what we mean by speed and speed is distance through time and that's all speed is we're not talking about acceleration which is the change with speed through time we're talking about speed which is just how fast are you going in a given direction and and how much distance do you cover in an interval of time so with these kinds of measurements we do that pretty well. People can measure speed very well, and we can measure things going left and right, and we will call that X. Why not? Because what the heck. So X shall be, for the purposes of this lecture, our label that we will call any distance measurement that we're going left or right. Back and forth, we'll call Y. Why? Because, you know, I like you. So Y is the left, is the back and forth measurement, and the up and down measurement is Z or Z for those out in London, and the distance measurement, all these things are distance measurements. You can go either way with distance, but with time, we're watching a clock tick, and clocks tick one tick after the other. So a time measurement is a value, is the total number of ticks that we see in a series of intervals that go tick, 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 where the intervals are regular for whatever reason that they are regular. And so what we have then was we are going to put all of these distance measurements and all of these clocks in a funny thing that we call an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame can be thought of very interestingly as a series of like almost like a jungle gym or a grid or a cube a series of cubes or grids of rods that are all connected at the ends they're going either backwards or forwards up or down or left and right and they're going x y or z directions and at the intersection of all these rods as they intersect in a vertex they will have a clock and so we've got these maybe they're one meter long rods and they're going left and right once it want, you have a clock and there's a rod going left and a rod going right one meter long and then maybe you have another rod going up that one meter and down one meter and maybe you have another rod going forward a meter and back a meter and so each of these things are at 90 degrees to each other and we can think of this as kind of a big big plus sign or what have you but that is a piece of our inertial reference frame now take a gazillion of these and put clocks on the ends of each of those rods and stick them all together in a big 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 lattice and what do you get you get what's called an inertial reference frame you can measure distances inside this frame and you can measure times inside this frame. All of the clocks in an inertial reference frame are synchronized together 
and all of the rods are the same length between the clocks. And that's our frame. So why do we want to bother doing that? Because we want to show how frames move with respect to each other. And that's what we call Galilean relativity. So Galilean relativity, because we're hunting for causality problems, we need to see how things move with respect to each other. So we're going to keep this really simple. And we're going to introduce a, a, the, the letter V for velocity. But we could just use the word S V for speed because we're not going to change velocity. Velocity. velocity implies direction, but this velocity is only in the x direction, which is uh, which is forward and backward, right? Which is a left and right, according to us on this grid. Remember, uh, y is back and forth, and z is up and down. So we don't care about up and down motion or back and forth motion. We only care about left and right motion. So if somebody's zooming by you at speed v then that is how you will say, oh, how fast are they going by me? They are going 60 miles an hour and in one hour they will travel 60 miles to my right that's what that means that's what that v is and that's what we mean by the x value and that's what x e minus vt means it's like oh what's your starting location how far will you go in a given period of time <clears throat> so we want to actually translate between two reference frames. That's how we're going to find our causality violation that gives us the thing that says that time travel can't happen. So stick with me. So let's actually see what this funny set of equations on the left-hand side really means. We have a series of things that we'll call unprime land. So we have our t, x, y, and z in unprime land. And we're going to postulate that we're outside a, move, a moving car. And the moving car is moving straight on a very straight highway going to the right, as it seems from this particular thing. And we're watching that car go to the right and it shall move with speed or velocity t v and it the inter the how fast how far it goes will be v times the time that you let you watch it go so x minus vt x is the direction that is the is the right hand direction y is the place is well x is where you measure it to be y is where you measure it to be and z is where you measure it to be since z is kind of like going up or down a hill we're not going up or down a hill, so it's going to stay at zero. It's not going to change. Y is going back and forth. Since it's a straight road, it's not going to change either. T will also change. It will tick. The clocks will tick. Now, Galileo said that everybody's clock is the same. That's what Galileo said. So you'll notice that the time is the same, these two equations there. But the distance, let's say somebody's going by you, they are going to move to your right as you watch them go by. And so specifically, if we want to look at the like, the, if we want to look inside the car, not just the car itself, but all the contents of the car. And in particular, let's look at a car's coffee cup holder and a coffee cup inside the coffee cup holder next to the driver of the car. And so as you move, as you see, the car has a coffee cup in it. The coffee cup can be thought of as moving by you at 60 miles an hour. Now, if the car were completely invisible and everything were invisible, then you'd just see a coffee cup moving by you at 60 miles an hour. You'd wonder what's going on, and you'd wonder if there was an invisible car. And maybe, maybe you would. That would be very interesting, too. So there is a, an invisible coffee cup moving to the right. Well, it's visible to you because you're looking inside a transparent car, seeing the invisible, the visible coffee cup inside a transparent car or semi-transparent because, you know, there's a guy driving in there and pit or a woman and maybe he or she or maybe they're going on a date when they're a transparent car and they're taking coffee with them. And so the coffee cup and the man and a woman are in the car. They're driving to the right. And it's a very strange looking thing is two people seem to be in there with a coffee cup between them and they're driving down the road. OK, so the car that is their speed, whatever it is, maybe 60 miles an hour. Now, what is it like inside the car? And that is the primed location. Remember, to them, it is at rest. They are at rest inside the car. The coffee cup is at rest inside the car. Everything is at rest inside the car. They're moving with respect to the outside world, but inside the car, they're all at rest. Nothing's happening, nothing's falling down, nothing's rocketing around inside the car. They don't have the kids with them, so nobody's throwing stuff from the back seat. So the car itself may be moving, and that is the reference frame, is the car. 
maybe the car is attached to this big reference frame and it's dragging it with it or something, but it's all threaded throughout the car. So the car is now the reference frame. Maybe they've painted the inside with all sorts of little clocks and they've, you know, they're kind of boxing themselves in with that, with that lattice of wire rods and things just to make sure that they can measure that nothing's actually moving, including themselves. So prime land we'll call inside the car or moving cabin. So nothing inside the car is moving. The car itself and all the contents and everybody in it is moving to the right very fast, according to us on the outside. And as they look outside to us, they'll see us going the other direction backwards. So notice that it's symmetric. If you're in the car, you feel at rest, but outside the car appears to be whizzing by. That's the essence of Galilean relativity. But everybody's clocks are the same. Everybody's clocks are the same, which means that in addition to that, let's say Galilean relativity, it actually means that speeds then add together. And this is where we're going to get onto the whole faster than light thing. Watch out. Okay, so now we're in this car. I'm in a car driving 100 kilometers per hour, you know, hey, metrics, right? So 100 kilometers per hour, which is 62 miles per hour, by the way, and you're on your way to internet fine by, fame by shooting a gun forward out of the moving car, and of course the bullet is going really fast, 1,000 kilometers per hour or 600 miles per hour, which is a pretty good fast bullet, and then some but diligent observer from the Hold My Beer Institute measures the bullet, of course, of course, going 1,100 kilometers per hour the car's speed is added to the bullet's speed because the bullet started from rest at 100 kilometers per hour in with respect to the car. If the bullet goes forward at 1,000 kilometers per hour, irrespective of wind resistance, right? Then we just get rid of the wind. For fun and enjoyment, get rid of the wind so it doesn't slow down. It'll simply add on. So Hold My Beer Institute is doing this great experiment and they find that the, some, they measure the speed of the bullet using a, uh, using a, using a local police officer's uh, held beer uh, a speed, a speedometer uh, or, or, or radar tr gun. And so what they find is that the actual speed of the bullet is going faster than it would otherwise because it's being shot out of a moving car forward. All right, so now do and now that's true instead the hold my beer and so it gives you a laser in the car and you can do the same exact thing if you're driving the car and you hold the laser out the window and you shoot it forward how fast is the laser going now if your car is say is going 10,000 kilometers per second very fast car very very fast car but if your car is going 10,000 kilometers per second you shoot a laser beam forward, which the laser is going 300,000, because it's light, it's going 300,000 kilometers per second, you do not, no one measures the laser going 3,100 kilometers per second. It does not get measured that way. The guy with the clipboard from, H, the, from HMBI measures it to be going 300,000 kilometers per, spec, per second. You in the car also measure it to, to be going 300,000 kilometers per second. If you somehow manage to get your car up to, say, 299,999 kilometers per second and shot that laser forward, the laser still would be going only 300,000 kilometers per second with respect to you in the car and with respect to the guy, to the clipboard guy. Both of you would see that. Light only goes the speed of light for all observers. That is the essence of special relativity. And if you don't think that's weird and you don't think that's very strange and why that's a central postulate to special relativity, then pause the video and think about it. Okay, you've done pausing, now come back. So that means that we no longer have Galilean relativity. No two observers, therefore moving with respect to each other, they both experience the world quite differently. Both measure the same speed of light. Both find and use the same exact physical laws, me measuring distance, time, mass, energy, everything. But in applying those laws, they measure different distances, times, masses, and so forth. And both of them are correct. Which one's correct? Both are correct. I'm going to say that one more time. Who's correct? Both are correct. Because this is what we know as, this is called special relativity. Relativity means it, you, the, the measurements that you make are correct for your reference frame. 
and they are translated. So you can translate your measurements into another measurement of the reference frame's measurements, and then there is a way to do that. And we'll discuss that very shortly. So now here's a trick, because everyone sees C. So you have a rocket, the, the spaceship is flying by, and they say, I go 0.1 C, or what tenth the speed of light. So the laser, the beam is going forward, so they see C. And this beam of light is always going to the, if it's going to the right, the rocket's going to the right. No matter how fast it's going, everyone sees C. And C is given by this is is the common way we talk about the talking about the speed of light. You'll see that through all of physics. And below is its exact value, 299,792.458 kilometers per second. That's that's actually the definition of the speed of light because special relativity is so well trusted and so well experimentally verified that this number is defined to be the speed of light because the speed of light is a universal constant. Everyone sees it, so it is a definition. All right, so Einstein then came along uh, in 1905 and reconfigured Galilean relativity and said, wait, 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 wait. If the two postulates of special relativity are correct, then we cannot use Galileo's, Galileo's configuration for the translation of going from one reference frame on the side of the road into the car anymore. We must therefore, because you would add speeds, because Galileo's relativity says we would simply add the speeds, but that is not true. That is not true in special relativity. In fact, it is experimentally verified to be not true, so we cannot use Galileo's way of transforming from one reference frame to another and measuring clocks and differences between them. How do we get between them? How do we compare our measurements from outside the car to inside the car as it's zooming by? How do we compare them? And we use these translation, uh, these four equations that translate the time and distance measurements. Notice under Einstein's configuration, we have the measurement of time, meaning outside the car, uh, to be t, x, y, and z, which are the unprimed things outside the car. And we have these all these funny things. We have c, we got the velocity. We've got now a gamma, which kind of looks like a crazy little y, which has, which is the inverse square root of the difference of, 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 from one of the squares of the velocity or speed at which they're traveling compared to the speed of light. So that gamma is a really interesting thing that shows the limitation between the two. But inside the car, again, remember, it's just the prime land, which is just what you're measuring. Prime land is, is inside the moving reference frame. And you want to translate your measurements outside of your reference frame into the measurements of somebody else inside the other reference frame. That's why the minus was there in the Galileo's group. It's not that it's how fast they're going. We're trying to translate from one reference frame to the other because we want to compare the two reference frames. We want to compare ours to theirs. And we want to know how they compare. It's this translation group that tells us how they compare. And notice the time now has a bunch of very complicated looking things associated with it. It's no longer just the times are equal. We no longer have that. The time measurement that we do on the ground is different than the time that we, that we see if we look at a car going by. The clocks are no longer in sync. And in fact, they read very different numbers. Your gamma there is always going to be some number that will be, uh, if it's going to be the closer it gets, the V gets to C, meaning approaches C, then that number approaches one on the, in the big gamma thing. And if it approaches one, then the difference is really small. And the inverse of a very small number is a very large number. So the, the farther, the more that you, uh, the, the faster it's going, the, more, the slower the time appears to be going in the moving reference frame according to us outside. So everyone sees the speed of light the same, and it also leads us to a new conserved quantity. And that quantity is very important to note, and that's what that little equation down in the lower right is all about. And the little equation way down in the lower right is the following thing. There is an invariability now of the space-time interval. The space-time interval is invariant for all observers in special relativity. 
Notice that we have our dt squared, our dx squared, dy squared, and dz squared. Now, what do these d's mean? And what these d's mean is a little bit of distance. So a tiny change in x, y, or z, or a tiny change in the time. And we add those things up. And notice that there's a really strange thing about the dt, is that it's multiplied by the speed of light, right? And both of those things are squared. And it's got a minus sign in front of it. So if we take the distance that has changed in x in our frame and the change in, in time in our frame, multiply that by the speed of light and difference those two things. And then we look at ds, which is now what we call the space-time interval. And that's the thing that doesn't change. Now inside one reference frame, the ds is one thing. And outside, the, in the other reference frame that's moving by it, the ds is the same. The ds squared is the same. So both of that, both observers see the same space-time interval. And this is because they can translate between the two reference frames using the four equations below, with the gamma being kind of defined off to the side just for front, just for things. And those four reference frames are called the those four translations are called the Lorentz transformation. And we're literally saying, hey, I'm measuring my time and space over here, and I'm seeing somebody zip by. How what do their clocks look like? What do their measurements look like? And how can I translate from there to there? So the space-time interval is the thing that measures between them. And in fact, that you can actually take the two sets of things and, and, and sum them up in this way, and, they fall, and the things fall out as, as an equivalence. I invite you to actually plug the gammas in and see if this actually works with respect to this ds squared. So the space-time, or is it called space-time? So uh, that's the important thing. Before Newton Einstein came along, the concept was is that space and time were separate things. The universal clocks ticking everywhere, a god clock from that started now and goes on. And that was Galileo's idea. That was Newton's idea. That's what they operated under. But we find instead that because the speed of light must be a constant for all observers, then we have to mix space and time. And so when we talk about space time, this is why. So we don't measure say in left right backwards and forwards just that we measure left right backwards and forwards and subtract from it the time interval squared times the speed of light squared and that total summation three positives and one negative gives you the space-time interval through which an event occurs or, or or the distance between two events or just where something is in space and time and that's the important thing and that's why we call it space time is because the space time interval ds squared is the new invariant it's the thing that is there so newton's law said that they were separate they were absolute galileo thought that newton realized there was something a little wacky about that but you know he he didn't have the energy or 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 there was not the knowledge for him to actually pursue it but eventually einstein came along and found yes they're together and this is all a result of the of of the results of Maxwell's equations or Maxwell's formulation of electromagnetism, the electromagnetic uh, Maxwell's electromagnetism showed that there must be something strange about the speed of light. And if you go look at my video on the Michelson Morley experiment, you will learn more about that. So we now know that the true way of talking about distance in space and time is to mix them together using this ds squared or the space time interval. And that's how we measure distances in space and time. That's what it's always about. And notice that they're together. So in sum, everyone sees C. No matter how you're moving or where you're moving or how you're oriented, everyone moving uniformly always measures the speed of light being the same. The speed of light is a constant for all observers, no matter how they're moving with respect to the source or if they are the source. So let's take an advantage of that to look at a couple examples. First, let's create a bouncy, bouncy light clock. So we have a box that's one and a half meters high, and we got a laser that shoots a laser off a mirror and bounces it off and it gets to a detector. Because it's th uh, the, tra the path is exactly three meters, it makes a little bit of a nice math. It makes it uh, basically nanometers is what we're talking about. Nanoseconds is what we're really talking here. So we can think of this as a clock, meaning the laser shoots pulses at regular intervals, and the detector tells the time by listening for those pulses. 
And that's what we care about, is the pulses that come from the laser and the detector. And the laser's just doing its thing, and the detector's doing its thing and detecting them. So the pulses occur, the detector detects, and as it detects them, that is just the same as a ticking clock. So what we find then because of special relativity is that time dilation shows that moving clocks run slower. Why? All right. So now let's take our bouncy light clock and put it on a rocket and launch it. And now it's going really, 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 really fast. Maybe 80% the speed of light. That's a really fast rocket. Ah, we got some money from, from we got a big, a big boost of money from Congress. They got over themselves and decided to fund our, our near light speed attempt to go to Alpha Centauri with our friends so that we can have Alpha Centauri cake because they hear that there's a really good review on, on Yelp. Okay, so the, on the rocket while we're traveling to Alpha Centauri to get that really great cake, we're taking time measurements to see how long it takes. And our clock is this bouncy light mirror thing. That's what's doing it. That's our clock. Now let's say there's somebody on the moon watching us go by or on Pluto or halfway out between there that just got stranded so they were just watching us go by. As they watch us go by at 80% the speed of light, they see the laser move out from the, the pulses move out of the laser, be out of the source, bounce off the clock and get to the detector. Notice because it's moving to the right at 80% the speed of light that the actual path length that it takes is longer than if it were standing still. So on measured on the rocket, we see a three meter path. Measured by someone watching it go by, it's a much longer than three meter path. Maybe five meters is what we have. And that's why I chose 0.8c because hey, that makes it a lot easier for the math. So, but both are correct. Why? because the laser is moving. It just means something interesting. The rocket speed, according on the rocket, how fast is the rocket going? A constant speed of zero inside the rocket. Nothing's moving, everything's still, everything's stationary. The reference frame of the rocket is fully stationary, but on the ground or in space, watching it go by, it's moving by at 0.8 the speed of light, 80% or 0.8 the C. That's really fast. Now the photon speed, the photons that are leaving the laser and going to the detector are moving at the speed of light C. No matter what you do, that's what everyone sees. Everyone sees C. So the fo inside the rocket, the photon's path length that it goes is three meters. Watching it from the ground or from space, the path length we see is five meters. And so therefore one tick of the clock on the rocket is just, a, just 10 nanoseconds. However, on the ground, it is actually 16 nanoseconds, which is really interesting. So on the ground, away from it, watching it go by, we see that actually the, the ticks take longer because the path length is longer. So therefore, time must be slowing down. Therefore, there's no absolute time and we everything's affected by this. Heartbeats, movements that people see. It's not just this clock. It's everything. People's movement, speech patterns, everything. You drop something, it falls slower. Everything appears to be moving slower on the rocket as it zooms by. That's really fascinating. Also, there's another effect as well, which I'm going to use this way. So when cosmic rays hit the Earth's upper atmosphere, meaning there's these particles from outer space, maybe they're coming from the sun, maybe they're coming from a distant supernova, and they impact our upper atmosphere, what happens is, is that they hit the Earth's atmosphere at very high speeds, extraordinarily high speeds. They create numbers of particles in a cascading shower, and some of the particles that are created, I mean, the particles are like protons and helium nuclei or electrons, that's what's hitting the atmosphere. And, you know, they're, they're packing a punch. But when when they hit the nitrogen uh, or they hit the nitrogen molecules uh, or the oxygen atom oxygen molecules or the ozone or something and they hit something in the atmosphere they create a cascading shower of subatomic particles and some of them are called muons and a muon will decay rather rapidly as it fall as it goes and it'll last only a few milliseconds a few microseconds before it's before it decays and a muon will become i believe an electron or something else and some other stuff so from the muon what's fascinating is is that they these things are created very high in the earth's atmosphere and as a result they're, they're also byproducts of decays of other things so they get created very high up so what will happen is is that they have a very short lifespan 
and the cosmic rays themselves hit the Earth's atmosphere and then they live for this short period of time and decay. So they're, but the height of the Earth's atmosphere and the speed with which they're known to traverse the Earth's atmosphere shows that they shouldn't make it to the ground. It's like saying, hey, I want to get, uh, I want to travel 100 miles in one hour and I want to only go 10 miles an hour. Everybody looks at you and shakes their head and says, oh, you got to go 100 miles an hour if you want to make 100 miles in one hour. He says, no, I want to get there in 10 by only going 10 because I'm scared of going fast. People would shake, shake their head at you. But muons go, they actually, their lifespan is very short. And if the distance from the top of the Earth's atmosphere, where they are formed, to the bottom, if you're traveling at normal speeds or even very, very high speeds, is, is, too, is too far a distance for them to traverse such that they make it to the such that they can make it to the ground at all. Well, that's what's interesting. From the muon's point of view, what happens which is really interesting? The muon sees something different. Well, we see that the that the that the muon itself lives longer because it's moving faster. Now, what does the muon see? The muon just lives, remember it sees its own reference frame its own reference frame everything is normal so how can it then live for that length just because we see its clock going slower the flip side is is that the muon sees the atmosphere as shorter so there is a length contraction in the in the uh, direction of motion and from the muon's perspective remember it's at rest and it's traversing something the speed with which it's traveling through the Earth's atmosphere means the Earth appears to be rushing at the muon. The muon's not moving. I'm just a muon. I'm hanging out. I'm at rest in my reference frame. I don't care how fast you think I'm going. I'm at rest. And the muon is flying down through, so the Earth's atmosphere is contracted as a result of its motion. But, or, or more specifically, it looks like the Earth is rushing towards it. So what the muon sees is the Earth's clocks are ticking slowly and the atmosphere is foreshortened and everything is smaller in the direction of motion. So therefore we have this funny, 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 funny thing. In the laboratory reference frame, meaning watching it fall, we see it get created maybe at the top of the mountain and the mountain appears a normal height to us. But if it were created at the top of the mountain, it wouldn't make it to the bottom of the mountain because it lives too short a period of time. So therefore it has time dilation. We see its clock running slowly due to the Lorentz transformation and the constancy of the speed of light and the space-time invariant interval. So we see, we measure its clock running slowly, and that's why it can get from the top of the mountain to the floor, to the ground. However, the muon, inside the muon's reference frame, the clock is running normally. So the only way that can happen, both things can happen, is if according to the muon, the atmosphere is foreshortened because it's, the Earth appears to be rushing at it. That is interesting and it's called uh, length contraction. So the muon sees length contraction. It would also see our clocks running slowly, but for this purpose, the most important thing is length contraction. And we see its clock running slowly and muons are basically have no size. So we really can't tell if it's having length contraction. That's really interesting. And in fact, what I've just described is something that is actually observed and is one of the tests of special relativity. So the consequences of special relativity are the following. All observers that move relative respect to each other, they do not measure the same times. If you're moving with respect to me, I see your clock differently. And it's symmetric. You see my clock running slowly. Both measurements are correct. They disagree, therefore, on what things happen at the same time. You do not measure the same lengths, you do not measure the same masses, and therefore, another important thing, which we won't discover here, but you can go look at my other videos on special relativity, you'll find that this is a reason why mass and energy are equivalent. And therefore, anything that has no mass moves at the speed of light. So light has no mass, so therefore it moves at the speed of light, and it can only move at the speed of light in its own reference frame, which is really fascinating. So we have, the, these are incredibly important consequences of special relativity. And now we have the machinery in order to say, what about tachyons? Tachyons are hypothetical, totally dreamed up particles that always move, always move faster than the speed of light. If one came nearer, you wouldn't, if one came near you, you wouldn't see it. 
until it arrived. Why? Because it's moving faster than the speed of light. So any communication that would come from it can't get to you until it's at you. So tach tachyons, if they existed, would simply appear. And then you'd see this really, really funny thing as one piece of it is receding away from you and another piece is, 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 coming to, is going the other direction. So from wherever it went, came from, the direction it came from, you'd see a piece going the opposite direction, running backwards in time, and we would see something moving forwards in time as well. well actually, both pieces would appear to be moving forwards in time, but we see there would be the same particle apparently moving in opposite directions. And so there's that kind of crazy diagram. I, I, it's a very tricky thing to talk about, but let's just give it a, that's why I give this kind of tadpole -y sort of diagram. Please go look it up on the Wikipedia. It's a nice little article. But the thing is, is that these things move faster than the speed of light, and the less energy they have, the faster they go. So if they're at zero energy, they would be running at infinite speed. Now, if you want to get them slower, then you have to impart more energy into them. The more energy you give to them, the slower they go, and the slowest possible speed for a tachyon is the speed of light. So you can't actually make one stand still. There is no such thing as holding a box of tachyons. So that's another funny thing. Where are you going to get a box of tachyons from? Well, you can't find them because remember, once you found them, the only reason you know where they're there is because there they are and now they're with you. So tachyons move uh, faster than the speed of light. They cannot be made to move slower than the speed of light in any reference frame. So the mass of, an imag of tachyon would therefore be imaginary, which is a funny way of saying the mass has the square root of minus one in front of its mass, which is a very, very strange concept. What would that even mean to have a square root minus one mass? Well, that's a tachyon. Here's the tough thing about tachyons is that they don't exist. There's no actual experimental ex evidence that any of these things exist. Eh, it kind of sucks because we could build a thing called a tachyonic anti-telephone. So a tachyonic anti-telephone is a telephone that is a very strange thing. It sends messages backwards in time. That's what an anti-telephone is because you call up a friend. You want to say, hey, how are you? And they answer, I'm fine. And then you say, that's great. Let's go to a movie. Sounds great. Which movie? I don't know. And thus, and thus begins every conversation about going to movies. So in 1907, Albert Einstein thought of the created after he did in 1905 his special relativity. 1907, he said, how you can actually have a faster than light signal that would then violate causality. And more important than special relativity is actually this function, this thing called causality. Causality is a core concept in physics. Because you can't just have something that happens before something else unless that thing that happens before something is the thing that causes the thing to happen that, that comes after it. Right. So this is called Tolman's paradox in that you can create a fast, any faster than light signal will create a paradox of causality. That's the thing. So let's see what that is. No faster than light trans. So just I'm going to this is this is not a mystery. So the point is, is that according to the current understanding of all physics, no such faster light transfer is possible. Tachyons don't even exist theoretically inside the standard model of particle physics. So there's no even re experimental reason they exist and there's no justification for them in any model of particle physics. But they have them in the science fiction shows and everybody thinks time travel is possible, which it isn't. So let's talk about it. So here we go. Welcome to Fantasy Spaceland. So I've got two brothers, Damon and Travis, and they want to try out their tachyon anti-mobile device to see how it works. So this is an idea that was laid out by David Baum back in 1965, and I'm just going to play with this idea. Go, ch go check this out. So we got two brothers, Travis and Damon. They're in, opposite, they're in different rockets. And they're zipping by each other. And what they do is they have in those little red boxes, what do they have? They've got tachyon anti mabel devices. And those are the red boxes with the thing in it. So they're going to communicate with the tachyon anti mabels. And the tachyons themselves have been calibrated, have been established to traveling at that incredibly slow speed for them of 2.4 times the speed of light. So 2.4 times the speed of light is pretty fast. That's really fast. That's faster than the speed of light. That's what tachyons do. So let's say the two ships now pass each other at, point, at going at a relative speed of 80% the speed of light or 0.8 C. 
And just when they pass each other, just at that passing, when the tachyon, when the tachyon antimabels are close to each other, we'll call that the zero point or the starting place or the origin. And you'll see why later. Okay, so now they pass each other and they keep going. So at 300 days after they pass each other, Damon, according, at t under, according to Damon's clock, at t under 300 days, he has some bad tacos. So he gets in the in the spaceship taco fridge, and he goes in there, and he gets taco, 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 and he grabs that stuff, and he gets some good things. He says, "Wow, it's gonna be a great taco." And then he adds, "Oh man, 300 days, that's pretty old taco meat." So he eats the taco meat, and he gets he gets a little sick, and he has he has an event later in the afternoon. So he says, "Oh goodness, I ate some bad taco meat." So he's going to send that message to, to Travis. And the message is going to travel until it gets to Travis, according to Damon, at a speed of 2.4 times the speed of light. Now, from Damon's perspective, they're moving really fast. So it's going to take a little bit of time for the tachyons to catch up with Travis. So therefore, Travis moves a little bit further and it finally catches up to him. At 300 days, he sends this. Now, according to Damon, Damon looks because it takes 150 days for the tachyon to travel to Travis's to anti -ta anti mabel tachyon anti mabel it takes 150 days according to Damon to travel 2.4c over to Travis. That's when it arrives according to Damon at Travis's rocket as at Damon's clock of 450 days. But Damon measures because of special relativity and they're moving uniformly, not accelerating or decelerating. Notice I don't have rocket engines going; they're just going and coasting at that very fast speed past each other. Because of special relativity, Damon measures Travis's clock as going slow. So therefore, the time dilation that he that Damon measures Travis to be means even though Damon's clock reads 450 days, Travis's clock only measures to at that moment 270 days since they passed each other. That's because of the time dilation effect of special relativity that Damon sees on Travis. So Travis knows that the anti tachy mabel will do something interesting. So he says, ah, don't eat the taco meat. So he's going to send a message back to his brother and say, don't eat that meat. And so watch what happens. So the return, Travis's return message travels at two point, also because it's the same machine, travels at 2.4 C starting when his clock, because that's what his clock reads. His clock reads 270 days. That's what his clock reads. 270 days. Okay, again, time dilation is symmetric. So Travis measures Damon's clock to be running slowly. So because Travis's clock says 270 days, going back to there, Travis sends his message. Damon's clock, according to Travis, at the time he wants to send it, when his clock says 270 days, Damon's clock, according to Travis, reads 162 days. So he sends it along. And it arrives. Travis's clock then gets to Damon when Damon's clock reads 243 days. Wait, that's 57 days in Damon's past. And so Travis now effectively warns Damon about eating the taco meat two months before he even eats it. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's called a causality problem. This all arises, this whole thing arises because the Lorentz transformation as we measure time and distance from moving from one frame to the other frame uniformly back and forth to each other, no matter what, and because of time dilation and the constancy of the space-time interval, we've just created a way of sending a message that Damon can send effectively a message into his own past, which is really fascinating, knowing what Travis would do. So, Tachyons, therefore, violate causality. And because their messages go backwards in time with respect to the reference frame that's moving according to Tachyon's source. That's really interesting. So what do we mean? Let's look actually look at the numbers here for just a bit. So special, special relativity demands causality, or at least it doesn't really demand causality. It just, physics demands causality. That's a very important thing. Causality is just a cornerstone of our thinking. And we're not going to let that go for any reason whatsoever. None. I mean, really, we're not going to let that go. So by when it's measured by Travis, the, me the message from Damon arrives at 270 days on Travis's clock as measured by Travis. Damon's clock, when it measured, when Travis's clock measures 270 days, Damon's clock would read, according to Travis's measurements, 162 days. So what does he do? He sends his message across to Damon because this is what Travis sees. He just says, oh, I get a message. 
kink, it just appears at 270 days. So he sends a message, which takes some time to get to Damon. So according to Travis, Damon will get it 243 days. That's just fine. But notice it is kind of traveling backwards in time from Travis's clock to Damon's clock. It's going 270 to 243, which is really interesting. So that's what Travis sees. He sees the tachyon message going really fast to Damon, gets to Damon's clock at 243 days. Well, let's see what Damon measured. Remember, Damon sent the message at 300 when his clock said 300 days. And by his measurement, Travis's clock would have said to 180 days because of special relativity and time dilation. So when Damon's message gets there, his clock is advanced to 100, 450 days and Travis's clock has only advanced to 270 days because of time dilation. That's important. He started the conversation by sending the message when his clock read 300 days. Interesting. So now Travis then sends the message when he gets it, when his clock measures 270 days, and he sends it back to Damon, and Damon's clock now measures 243 days. So therefore, it must measure when he goes back into his past, so that's why it's in orange, because this is not possible. This is bad, which is Damon's past. So therefore, only one message can be sent first. Both situations cannot be true, because only one of them can happen first. Either Travis sent the message first, or Damon sent the message first. But we know Damon sent the message first, so therefore Travis cannot send it because he could not have received it because this whole thing is a way to send something back in Damon's time. This violates causality. So this is important because causality of violations happen because special relativity demands that the reference frames experience all the same laws of physics, including special relativity, including measurement of time, Everything happens as the way it should be according to all inertial reference frame observers. There's no safe way then, therefore, to have the laws of physics and to have faster than light travel. Which means that you can't even win by including gravity in general relativity because in a small enough space, the core elements of general relativity that make it usable is if you have a small enough space, you can always measure the coordinates of general relativity in terms of special relativity. So in a small enough area, you get special relativity. You can't do special relativity globally in GR, but you can do a small enough area. So you don't win with general relativity. And in fact, you could make your measurements so small that they don't violate the curvature of space time. Maybe we have these things are little ants going half the speed of light. So it's a really tiny thing. We don't care if it's that they're thousands of miles apart. No, maybe they're a foot apart when they do this thing. But so therefore we can have a curvature, really strong gravity, but yet in a small enough area, it's special relativity. All right, so we don't win. That's important thing. We don't have special relativity, special relativity and causality, demand no faster than light travel, caught tachyons, which are the putative best thing, or is, is something that would move at the faster than the speed of light, People have talked about them for a long time, so tachyons would be, you know, the first choice. We can make up anything else we want, but anything moving faster than the speed of light would have the same problem. And special relativity is really, really, really well uh, established. It, in fact, is the core of most of our measuring system at this point. So we do have a few caveats, of course, like the indices of refraction. You can actually make materials where the speed of light in the material is very, 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 very slow, and photons pass through very slowly, and you can make it so that an electron might go faster than the speed of light in the medium that it, that it lives. And that's, it'll create what'll we'll call this blue light called Cherenkov radiation. It's like uh, something like say a neutron or something is going faster than the speed of light in the medium. And you'll see the blue glow in say a nuclear reactor pictures because that blue glow is from neutrons that are going faster than the speed of light in water because of how fast they're coming out of the, of the pile of, of, of nuclear material. So we also then have the, uh, well, but that doesn't really, but we're talking free space. At, from the previous thing, but even indices of refraction like this, where no matter what, we can't use an index of refraction to push us things back in time because again, we would find causality problems if we did that. We can't, we can't do that because now we actually have some other signals faster, traveling faster than light, and that's the electron. So an electron can move faster than light in a medium like water, or a neutron can. 
So the next one is the Big Bang, because if you go far enough away from us, the remember the universe is expanding at about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. You get enough megaparsecs between you and some distant galaxy, and the universe is expanding at faster than the speed of light away from you past that point. Now that's interesting, and people say, well, they're rushing away from us. Well, we didn't push them. And this is only due to the expansion of space itself and not due to anything else. Space itself can expand at faster than the speed of light because it's not a thing, it is space. And so, you know, that's tricky. But the also, we're also looking at the nature of the, the, when you expand space, you are expanding at kilometers per second per megaparsec. So you can't actually send a signal back and forth. You can send one signal, say what the distant galaxy looked like a long time ago, and when we get it, we can't send anything back to it because we're looking from the past. Again, special relativity still works here because we're looking at the galaxies in the past. We don't see them as they are now. Quantum entanglement is also a really funny thing. You take two, uh, two particles, you put them in two separate boxes, you shake them up, you, uh, in, and you inter have them interact in some way. They become in an entangled quantum state, and you can separate them. And then they will, then when you measure one of them, the other one's measurement will say, maybe that you're measuring spin up on a particle, and you open the box, and you, you, you put two particles together, and then you say, let them, let them interact. And as you let them interact, you separate, you put them each in their own box without observing them. You just know they're in separate boxes, and you separate the boxes apart and then when you measure the spin on one and you know that both of them either the particles are either spin up or spin down and there must be one must be spin up and one must be spin down so therefore when you open one of the boxes up that one that's you open that spin up in entanglement might say that fixes the other one to spin down and so we find that the way that that's explored because that was Einstein's spooky action at a distance and it's also been experimentally verified that there are no hidden variables so this concept of quantum mechanics entanglement seems to make people think that there's faster than light travel happening but really it's actually you'd say that the entire thing with the space between it and the entire mechanism that did the separating is the thing that is the quantum experiment so you actually didn't separate them everything that separated them put participate in, the, in that is part of the entanglement now too so that is they've all been entangled and so that information has been made part of them so the quantum entanglement itself and I know that was really fuzzy I'm sure I'm gonna get flamed for it but hey quantum entanglement itself it still does not violate causality and still does not yet constitute a faster than light travel however the most important thing is it's fun Faster than light travel, smells fun, is fun, and makes for really good science fiction stories, and you're gonna get all sorts of really great stuff if you go find it. Some of the stories are good, some of them are bad, but unfortunately for today, even though people really wanna do it, and if you go hunt around, you're gonna find legitimate scientists and legitimate thinking actually trying to figure out if it's possible to go faster than the speed of light. And the reason for that is that would show a flaw in special relativity or a flaw in general relativity. But so far, as according to normal science, rules and normal science rules are theories and ideas stand the test of time because they satisfy experiments and nothing else can explain them so so far every experiment that's been done no matter how it's been done has confirmed the 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 truth of special relativity that doesn't mean it won't be overthrown but it does mean that right now special relativity wins the day and it does mean that maybe some smart rabbit will come up with some interesting thing some woozle compactorator that actually does send the ham trottle faster than the speed of light but that will involve upsetting hundred a hundred years of experiments that verify that faster than light travel cannot be done and that it violates causality. So the only way faster than light travel would be allowed is if it doesn't violate causality. Or if it does, then an experiment might say, well, if you violate causality, you're not violating the causality of our universe. You are in a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and it's just fine to, have, to alter the past of some other universe, which you're not part of. So when you send something back in the past, you are not actually influencing yourself, you're influencing some other universe and your future goes on normally, but you've sent that message back in the past and it's gone to some other place. I hope that this has been a lot of fun for you and we'll see you next time.